Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name's Carl Schneider. I'm the editor of Farmers Weekly. And on behalf of Farmers Weekly and Syngenta, I want to give you a very warm welcome to tonight's lecture, the third in our Arable Horizon series of lectures. Now, the idea behind these lectures is really simple. Firstly, we identified what we thought were the five areas of science and technology that were going to have the biggest impact on the way we farm, or the way we grow crops over the next 20 to 30 years. And then for each of those areas, we've identified people who are leading researchers in that field to talk about how developments in that field could change the way we farm over the next 20 to 30 years. It's a simple concept, but so far it's worked really well. Um, now, these lectures take place in front of an invited audience, so thank you very much for coming along here. Um, it's also streamed live over the internet, so we've got an unknown number of people watching this live over the internet. Uh, and it will be available, the video from the event will be available to view and to download immediately after this lecture on the Farmers Weekly website or on our YouTube channel. Uh, and it will be written up in Farmers Weekly in two weeks' time. Now, we've, I said we've already had two lectures in this series. The first one um, was on uh, plant breeding and genetics, and the second one was on soil science. Today, our subject is robotics and automation. Uh, I'm personally very excited about this topic as a former physicist and engineer. Um, and it's certainly a very hot topic at the moment. I woke up, I always wake up listening to farming today and then followed by the Today programme on Radio 4. And I woke up two days ago to hear uh, them talking about robotics on farm. There was a big piece in the Financial Times uh, on Tuesday about farm robotics, which actually featured our two speakers tonight. Um, and I think the reason is clear that um, Firstly, there have been some really exciting technical developments in this field that means that over the next few years, I think we can expect to see a stream of exciting new technologies, many of which we're going to hear, hear about tonight. And so there's the push of new technology, particularly in some fundamental technology areas like robotic uh, 3D vision. Uh, but also there's, of course, the pull of the, you know, the, the shortages of labor on farm and with the, the fear of those getting even worse uh, in the post-Brexit period. <coughs> I, it's fantastic to be here in the National Space Centre in Leicester. I've wanted to come here for years. Um, I'm a, a child of the 60s, so I grew up watching the Apollo space programme, so this is a fantastic place for me. But I think it's particularly appropriate, given that the, you know, the, the impact that that Apollo programme had on a whole generation of people like me. I would hope that the exciting new technology that's coming onto our farms over the next few years could have the same impact on a, a new generation of people excited to come and work in what I still think is one of the most exciting industries on the planet. Um, I want to thank Syngenta for supporting these lectures. We couldn't do this program without Syngenta. It costs a lot of money to put these on. You can see there's lots of technology around streaming this over the internet. Uh, and I want to thank Syngenta. It shows their commitment to the technology and the future of farming that they're willing to put money into, into events like this. So thank you very much, Syngenta. Um, before I introduce the speakers, I just want to say a couple of things about the way things work tonight. It's called, it's called interactive lectures, and there is some real interactivity here. So firstly, uh, we have a technology called Slido. Can we put that up on the screen? Uh, so all of you, if you've got a mobile phone in your pocket, if you want to take it out now, if you haven't already done this, and go to www.sli.do, that's Slido. Um, and it's a very simple interface, and then it just there's a box on it that asks you for a code. And you put in the code, that code there, 3385, and that makes sure you're on this lecture. Don't put the wrong code in, or you'll be answering questions to some completely different lecture somewhere else in the world. Uh, so if you go to Slido, put in that code, then you can take part in the discussion uh, today. So firstly, we're going to be asking some polls. I'll give you an example of one in a moment here. Uh, and you can give your answers to those polls and get a feel for uh, the way people think, both here in the audience and people on the internet can vote in these polls. But also, later on, I'm going to ask our two speakers to join me on the stage, and we're going to have a Q&A session. And at any point during the evening, if you want to type in your questions into Slido, then we'll be drawing our questions later on from the questions that you are. So at any point during the evening, if anything that someone says prompts a question in your mind, just type in the question on Slido, and it will be fed through to us in, the, in, the, in that Q&A session later on. Now, the second piece of interactivity is something called a microphone board. Has anyone come across a microphone board before? Uh, can someone throw me one? Actually, it's probably going to be dangerous if you throw it from there. 
looks like a giant M&M, but this is a microphone ball. So when we ask the questions for the q and I'm going to ask you to put your questions on Slido. If, you, if, you, if you're really nervous, you can do it anonymously, but I'd ask you to put your name on the question and indicate whether you're in the room rather than on the internet. And if you're in the room, I'll get you to ask the question yourself rather than me just read it out on the stage. And when, when I call you, I'll throw you this. So Adam, can you demonstrate? I'll throw it at you like that, and you'll catch it just like Adam did then. Hello, hello. You can see you can, the microphone works in the ball, and then you can throw it back to me. So it avoids that sort of embarrassing kerfuffle when microphones get passed around the, uh, the audience. Um, oh, and the last thing to, about the interactivity is, like all things these days, we, there'll be a discussion on Twitter, and the Twitter hashtag is Arable Horizons, all one word. Okay, on to the big event tonight. We're very lucky to have two fantastic speakers tonight. I'm going to introduce them one at a time. They're going to speak one after the other. Uh, and our first speaker is Professor Tom Ruffin. Uh, Tom is Professor of Computer Science at the University of Lincoln here in the UK, just down the road, where he leads the Lincoln Center for Autonomous Systems. Now, the area he's researching into includes autonomous robots, artificial intelligence, and mach machine perception, with applications including agriculture and assistive technologies. Now, Tom's going to look at the broad field of on-farm robotics and automation and try and paint a picture of where that could be taking us over the next 20 or 30 years. So I'll ask Tom to come up now and then I'll introduce our second speaker in a moment. So could you put your hands together for Professor Tom Brackett? <laughs> team for inviting us to, s to speak today, to speak about agricultural robotics, or, or perhaps I should say terraforming, given that we're in the, um, in the National Space Centre here in, in Leicester. Um, yeah, that's about as good as it gets, I'm afraid, but uh, I'll, I'll do my best. So, so yeah, my, my name's Tom Duckett, I'm Professor of Computer Science at the University of Lincoln. Um, I lead our robotics research group, which is called the Lincoln Centre for Autonomous Systems. We've been going for about 10 years now, and in the last couple of years, and we've got together with colleagues at, at the University of Lincoln to form the, the new Lincoln Institute for Agri-Food Technology, which, which is led by my colleague Simon. So that, that's a new institute that brings together re, uh, research from across the University of Lincoln, computer science, engineering, life sciences, food manufacturing, agriculture. I, I, Simon, tell me if I've missed anybody out. Um, to basically tackle uh, really challenging real world problems in, in agriculture. So basically I speak robot, and, and Simon speaks farming, so if, if we need a, a translator, then, then Simon's the man to go to. Okay, so, um, so just to give you a very little bit of back, a brief background on, on our research group, we're basically um, about 30-odd um, people at, at present. We're, we're nine academic staff, and, and we're about to recruit for two, two more lecturers, so if you know anybody who might be interested in, in a job, please let me know. Um, we've got about 25 uh, postgraduate researchers as well, and, and we're currently recruiting for a number of number of new projects, so we expect that to increase. Um, what do we do? We work on enabling technologies for robotic systems. So we're big into perception, especially vision systems, so making um, machines uh, use sensors to make sense of the world around them, and I'll talk quite a bit about that today. We're, we're big into learning, and, and I think that machine learning especially, this is, this is an important topic for agriculture especially, and we'll hopefully convince you why. Um, we also develop technologies to enable our systems to make decisions. Um, so for example, de to decide whether uh, a, a broccoli plant is ready to harvest or, or whether a particular plant is a weed and should be exterminated. Um, we also do research on, on developing control algorithms. So that's to actually make, um, make a robotic actuator motors um, do the thing that we want it to do. And we also develop technologies for interaction, meaning interaction with humans. Um, and I think that would be a good point, actually, to go to my demonstration, please. So, okay, um, it actually worked, which is good news. Um, so, basically, you can see a display here, and it's reflecting the output of this particular camera here. If I pick this camera up and move it around, you can see some green blocks on the screen, which are, which are heads of people that have been detected. It's mainly detecting people here in, in the front row. Um, so this is basically a 3D camera. Does anybody recognize it and know where it came from? Yeah? 
it's from a Microsoft Xbox. So it's actually a, um, an interfacing tool for a, for a Microsoft Xbox gaming system. Um, so it came along in 2010. Um, and the basic idea is that instead of using a, a joystick or a handheld controller, you use your own body as the controller. So you stand in front of the sensor and you make gestures and, and then it recognizes those and uses them to control uh, your character in the game. Um, but since 2010, this sensor has also been um, hacked and adopted by the robotics community, um, and, it, and it's really revolutionized robotics research. Um, why is that? Well, why it's different from a conventional camera, like a, um, like a color camera in your mobile phone. A conventional camera, uh, color camera will have three channels of information. It'll give you red, green, and blue information. This kind of sensor also has an additional channel, which gives you depth information. Um, so basically, as well as, give, as giving you colour coordinates, it gives you the geometric coordinates of, of things in the world. So, and that that's actually turns out to be really powerful, um, as it allows us to make much more robust algorithms for sensing them than before when we had to write, rely just on um, 2D vision. So if I can just show you what's on the screen, the, there's a, there's a colour image there, um, so you can see yourselves there. That's the depth image, um, and what we have over here is something called a point cloud, and that's basically a, a bunch of points in 3D space, and they're also coloured with the data from the colour camera. And in fact, if I, if I would grab the mouse, um, just to convince you this is actually 3D, I can, I can rotate the, the thing around, and hopefully you'll see that that's, that's not just a flat 2D image, that's a, that's a bunch of uh, 3D points. So what we're running here uh, is a piece of software which was developed together with colleagues, uh, by my colleagues at the University of Lincoln, together with um, colleagues on a, on a collaborative research project, which is called Strands, which is aiming to build long-running robots. It, it's a people detection system, and it was actually deployed recently on a, on a mobile robot in a care home in Austria, and we just reached a, um, a milestone that the robot was able to run for 100 days, fully autonomously in a care home, performing certain tasks to, to assist the people there, and it was rel relying on this technology to detect and recognize the people around it, uh, and then to be able to use that to per perform in a hopefully intelligent way around, around people. Um, just, just briefly, without getting into too many details how the algorithm works, it basically needs to work out where the floor is, so it needs to estimate roughly where the floor is, and then it's basically looking for tall, roughly human-sized objects, and it's basically an upper body detector. So it's looking for a round thing that looks like a head on top of a, 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 a something, a blob that looks like a torso. Um, you can fool it actually, if you would get a, a big box and put a balloon on top, you could probably fool it into thinking there's a, there's a person there. Um, so why do I think this is important for agricultural robotics? Well, uh, robots and humans are good at different things. So I don't think we'll go to fully autonomous robots for any, any time soon. I think that there's a space for robots and, and humans to work together, uh, to collaborate together. And, and I think therefore uh, for the robots to be useful working companions, they need to be able to recognize the people around them and, and perform in, intelligently together with the, with the people. Um, so yeah, if I could go back to the, the presentation, please. So, so that's, that's the technologies we're working on. Um, we're working in a number of different domains, including agriculture, which I'll talk about tonight, but some other related areas as well. We're working in intralogistics, which means warehousing, so making smart mobile systems that can move around in warehouses, for example, food warehouses. Um, we're also working on transportation, uh, autonomous driving systems, for example, which, which could be applied in agriculture. Um, security might be another one as well, because if, if you're, as a farmer, are going to invest lots of money in, in an expensive robot for your farm, then it might be nice if the robot could also have other functions as well, for example, being a security guard that could keep a watch on um, valuable equipment or look after the welfare of the people and the, and the livestock on the farm. And so that's a, that's a brief overview of what we do. Um, so here's a list of current projects. We, ha we have another we have a number of other projects and new ones starting, but these are these are the official ones that we um, that we're currently getting funded by the by the taxpayer to do. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of these projects in, in detail in the rest of this talk. So one project we're doing high resolution soil moisture mapping, and we've got a brand new sensor called the Cosmos sensor, which is actually inspired by Mars rovers. Um, Simon told me to say that, so um, yeah, so which is quite appropriate for the National Center for um, sorry uh, National Space Center. Um, so we're also interested in other properties of soil quality. Um, so for example, microbial activity, um, compaction and so on. So working together with colleagues at, at, at the Institute. Um, so as you've seen, we're using a lot of um, sensing technologies, 3D imaging technologies. Um, so we have a project on, on using, using that 3D vision to do robotic weeding, which I'll talk about a bit later on. 
Um, we've also got a project on, on robotic harvesting broccoli. Um, so, um, yeah, so it turns out actually sensing a broccoli plant is not so different from sensing a human. It's basically a round thing on a, on, on a stick, if you like, above the ground. So actually the algorithms that we develop for detecting broccoli are not so uh, different from the algorithms for detecting people. So we're also doing a, a lot of work on harvesting bio-inspired vision systems. And we've also got some new projects starting in manipulation, robot hands for picking fruit and, and even mushrooms, I believe. Um, so we have a, a brand new project as well, which we'll talk about shortly, um, where we're developing robots for, for berry production in polytunnels. And we're also getting into intralogistics as well, especially for the food industry. So that's sort of a brief background and overview of the projects that we're working on at the moment. Um, so let, let's, let's look at how, um, how this technology uh, might, might develop and, and, and where it can go. So one of the, one of the sort of underlying questions that's, that's fundamental to this research is can we make our agriculture more efficient and sustainable? So we're faced with a, with a growing worldwide population basically need to do more, grow, grow more food and, and other crops as well, biofuels and so, and so on with existing resources and we need to uh, feed a growing population. So how do we do that? How can we scale up the, the, the agricultural systems that we have now to produce more uh, with the current resources? Well, to look, um, to try and look to the future, it's good to look, look to the past. So, so sort of if you look at the development of um, agricultural machinery, uh, started off in antiquity with the invention of the plough. And, and that was pretty much the state of the art for hundreds of years until the Industrial Revolution. And then came along steam power and then, uh, and then we got to tractors. Um, and the trend in recent years has been towards bigger and bigger tractors. This is, this is the way to scale up the technology, to build bigger and bigger machines. Um, but there are, there are a number of issues with this. Um, um, so soil compaction is one. Um, using the reliance on fossil fuels is another. So is this really a sustainable long-term solution? Well, together with a number of colleagues that I see sitting in this room, and we think there is an alternative, and that's, that's to build autonomous robots. So rather than scaling up by building bigger and bigger machines, you could have a fleet of more and more smaller robotic systems, um, which could function off electric power, um, which could potentially do the job even more efficiently. Um, so just to, just to um, mention how, how is this going to come about, the technologies I'm going to talk, to, to talk about today require uh, platforms to run on. Um, so probably the closest route to market would be to, would be to basically retrofit existing uh, farm vehicles. So um, colleagues at Harper Adams University have been very successful and, and, and are very good at um, retrofitting, uh, at, at roboticizing farming vehicles. And this, this is an example um, uh, of this one of your slides, Richard, I'm not sure, from, 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 a, from a recent presentation um, of an autonomous tractor. So I think in the short term, the robotic technologies that I'm talking about tonight will be deployed primarily on existing farm vehicles, tractors, sprayers, or whatever. Um, in, in, in the longer term, I think we can also see something like this. This is, this is, um, this is a lightweight, electric-powered mobile robotic system. Um, it's one that we're working with uh, uh, now at the University of Lincoln, and it was actually developed by our colleagues at the Norwegian University of Life Sciences. So, so this, this is work done by uh, Professor Paul Fromm, who's, uh, who's now a part-time professor at the University of Lincoln, uh, as well as a professor in Norway. And I'll just show you a couple of videos of our robotics platform, which is called Thorvald, just so you can see it working. So basically, um, this is a mobile robot. It has a, a battery life of around 12 hours um, at the moment. But that, that of course, depends on the payload and, and the operations that you're trying to perform. Um, so it has four independently powered uh, wheels. Um, and there you can see the, the robot in the field. Is that broccoli? It looks like broccoli to me. Um, so there you can see, you know, get an idea of the mobility of the platform. And there's actually a, a, a similar sensor to this one mounted on the front to do some, some measurements there. Let's go to the next slide. Um, it's quite, quite a good, this is quite a good indicator of how, uh, how the system will deal with, with, yeah, very muddy conditions. So this is a field somewhere in Lincolnshire. Um, so the system's quite maneuverable and is able to cope with quite, quite severe levels of mud. In fact, I've got a, another video which is from uh, from from Paul in Norway. This 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 one was filmed recently in Norway, um, and there's there's a robot doing some kind of tillage operations. Um, so, and you'll notice the conditions there are rather wet. So, in Norway, they apparently have a have a two-month growing season, and it rains nearly every day. 
Um, so it's, it's not like Lincolnshire where it's sunny every day. It's, um, yeah. So, and Paul's got some nice videos actually of tractors trying to perform the same task and tractors getting stuck in the heavy mud and wheel spinning and so on. Um, so there could really be some advantages to having a lightweight uh, platform such as this um, that, that, that you could use for, for performing robotic operations on a farm. And then finally, just to illustrate um, the, the, the payload. So we're told that our robot can carry a payload of 200 kilograms. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what, what the payload is here, but we got two of our um, two of our colleagues to sit on the robot, and just to show you that it's quite, a, yeah, it's quite a robust and reliable system as well. Okay, so um, well, that, that's our robot, Thorvald. Um, not try to try to remember what's coming next. So, um, Thorvald is a nice piece of hardware. It's got great uh, electronics. It's also got some uh, onboard control, fairly fairly low level control, for example, for controlling the four wheels together. But all of the demonstrations you've just seen were done. At the high level control was done by a human with a with a joystick. So, so basically, someone was standing there re um, driving the robot by hand. Um, so, if we want to make the robots autonomous, then we need software. So if you like, hardware and software are the two sides of the, the coin in, in robotics. Um, so you need mechanical and electrical engineering to build the, build the hardware platforms, but then you need computer scientists to do the, to, to do the, the coding and try to, make, to, to develop the software for, to make the systems autonomous. So that's where I think uh, robotics can add something to, to, to the agricultural world. So basically, all, all robotic systems that, that um, or, or, or autonomous robot systems operate on a sense, think, act cycle. So they have sensors, like, like the one I showed you here, to, to interpret, make sense of the world. Um, then they have to do some kind of thinking, reasoning. So it might be decision making, it might be, de it might be some planning, so working out the sequence of actions that you need to take, for example, to remove a weed or to, to reach a certain point in space. And then they need actuators, that's motors and implements, to actually carry out the, the motor commands. Um, so the industry is already already very good at building actuators for implements for farming, for example. Um, I think what computer science and, and autonomous robotics can bring to the parties is the sensing and the, and the thinking side. Um, so in the past few years, we've had tremendous advances in, in, in both of these areas. We've got excellent our perception systems, vision systems for robots. We've got excellent reasoning systems that can work really fast, real time. And the challenge now is to put these things together and see if we can apply them to do useful things, um, for example, in agriculture. So these systems will need artificial intelligence. They will need vision systems. They will also need machine learning. Um, so the reason for that is because it's impossible for us to anticipate all of the tasks and the things that a, a mobile robot in the field will actually need to do. We can, we can program the robot initially, but then we, we know that under the real world conditions, there are always changes in the environment. There are different lighting conditions. There are different soil conditions. There, there are different types of crops which, which are changing. There are new diseases coming along and so on. Um, so we really, to make robust systems that work in real world environments, they need to be able to learn. Um, so so we, take ins we take algorithms inspiration from the field of machine learning, um, and I'll talk more about this. What these systems will also need to do is to be capable of lifelong learning, to be able to adapt their knowledge over time. So in, in robotics now, we've got quite successful at building short-lived robotic systems that can, can act for a few hours. Um, but now the challenge is to make those systems run for really long periods of time and to be able to learn and adapt and, and, and benefit from, the, from their experience. If you, if you had a robotic system that makes a mistake, well, that, that's okay, but if, if a robotic system would make the same mistake over and over again without learning from it, then you probably wouldn't think it was that intelligent. So we need robots that, that learn from their experience. Um, but as I said earlier, I don't think um, we're going to be looking at fully autonomous systems anytime soon. I think for the, for the next generation of farming robots, there will usually be a, a human in the loop somewhere. So if, if you've heard of, um, maybe you've heard one of the buzzwords going around at the moment is Industry 4.0 or farming 4.0, which is the, supposedly the, the, the fourth industrial revolution. And there they talk about cyber physical systems, which basically means systems that contain a human element and uh, a robotic element. So I, th I think this is, this, this is the future agri agricultural robots, I think, will um, involve robots, but also a human in the loop somewhere. So just to give, um, I was told you, uh, told you shouldn't ever put equations in a presentation like this, but, well, sorry. Um, <laughs> So one, one of the useful concepts is, is fan out, which, which means how many robots can, can a human con control? 
So, so basically, there are a number of a couple of factors that can influence this. So one is the activity time, the, the amount of time that a robot can run without assistance. So if you, if you can increase that, then you increase the fan out, the number of robots that a, a person can control. But then um, the more time you have to interact with the robot, um, that, that means that the fewer robots that, that you can deal with. So actually, um, if you look at some of the currently remote controlled systems, like uh, drones in military a applications, they actually have a very low fan out. They need more people than robots. Um, but, but I think in the future, uh, you're going to see robots um, with a much higher fan out, so one person can potentially control many robots. And, and we need this, of course, to scale these systems um, you know, to, to work on a high, higher, uh, higher volume. Um, yeah, so, um, so, so yeah, so hope, hopefully I'll, I'll give some examples and, and motivate um, how, how, we, how we can possibly do this in, in, in robotics for farming. Okay, so I'm going to talk now about, um, I'm going to, to illustrate some of this stuff, I'm going to give some case studies and I'm going to talk about some of the projects that we've had, um, that we've worked on in the past few years. Um, so the first one I'm going to talk about today is robotic harvesting of broccoli. So broccoli is an interesting crop because it's, current, because it's harvested selectively. So some crops, they do slaughter harvesting where you basically make a binary decision. You either harvest the whole field of, or, or you don't. But selective harvesting, you might make several passes through, through the field and you only harvest the crop when, it, when it's ready, when it reaches a certain specification. And broccoli is one of the crops that, that's harvested selectively by hand at the moment. And typically you'll have a gang of workers in a field. There's a picture there. And they might make three or four passes through a field um, s looking for the broccoli plants that are ready to harvest and, and then they'll harvest them by hand. So these people literally will use their left hand to hold the, the broccoli. The right hand has a big knife. Um, they'll, they'll check the specification of the broccoli. Basically, this, this is determined by the supermarkets. Is the head within a certain size range, a minimum and a maximum diameter? Then they'll cut the, cut the crop and then put the, the cut broccoli head onto a conveyor and it will go into the back of the... In, in, into the back of the tractor there. So currently you typically have one person driving the tractor and then a gang of six laborers who will be doing uh, actually very skilled work, work because it involves an incredible um, binocular vision system, an incredible manipulator which is the human eyes, eyes and hand. Um, so here you can see uh, a, an example of a couple of broccoli that are ready to harvest. One that's too big because it's gone to flower and one that's too small. Um, so the things we're interested in detecting with our vision system uh, well, we want to detect the broccoli, we want to be able to detect the location and the size. So we need the size to make the decision, is it ready to harvest, and the location to ultimately control a, a robot to, to cut the thing. So can, can we automate this? Um, so I'm presenting here some experiments that we did where we basically put a similar sensor to this one on, um, on a tractor. So we built a kind of enclosure there. It's, it's a box with some, some material that, that prevents too much infrared uh, radiation from the sun getting in. Um, there's some lighting inside. Um, and basically, you can see in the, in the picture on the right, this is a field in Lincolnshire somewhere um, with, 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 the, with the apparatus on the front. And we recorded data from, from the crop at various stages of the growth. Um, so broccoli is interesting for us because um, not least because it, 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 it has different growing seasons in different countries so in the UK broccoli is a summer crop but in Spain it, it's a winter crop so of course as researchers working on this we had to do a field study and, and go to Murcia in Spain um, to do some experiments and collect some data there as well um, so actually for the trip to Spain um, uh, we, we, we basically um, we changed the setup a bit um, we, we actually put the light box on the back of the tractor so we could mount it with a standard three-point li linkage. But basically, otherwise, the procedure was the same. We, we collected sensor data with this, with this system so we could then develop our algorithms and work with the 3D sensor data recorded in the field. Um, so basically, um, this is an overview of the system. I'm not going to go into too many technical details, but you can see on the left that some examples of the point clouds recorded with this kind of sensor. So this is the 3D the coloured point cloud data showing a couple of examples of broccoli. And on, on the right, there's a system architecture. Um, could we go to my uh, video on this, please? Lovely. So in a moment, I'm going to start this video. Not, not yet. Can we just pause it, please? <laughs> yeah. So this is basically gives you an overview of this system. And I'll just run through the steps briefly. So here, here again, you can see the, the tractor in the field. 
So we, first of all, we've got a sensing step, and there you can see an example on the top left of one of the, th the uh, point cloud images, the colored 3D images from, from the camera. And then basically we, we go through a number of steps. This is the image processing pipeline. This is how we process the data uh, and, and how we end up being able to locate the broccoli plant. So, okay, we do some filtering on the data, we remove some noise and things. Um, and we also have a depth filter, which basically, um, it's very similar to the people tracking system. Um, we basically need to identify where the ground is. So we use a depth filter for that. Anything below a certain depth we assume is the ground and we remove it. Um, and then what we do with, this, with the points that are left is we group them together or cluster them. So we get some blobs of stuff, if you like. So the second image here, you can see um, the ground's been removed. And we've also, so we're left with a number of blobs of stuff or objects, if you like. We've removed the smaller ones, which are too small to be a broccoli. And then, so we're left with these kind of blobs, and we have to make a decision, is it a broccoli head or is it not a broccoli head? Um, this video is on YouTube, by the way, and it's on our YouTube channel, so, so you can find it there as well. Um, so what we do, we have to get some kind of measurements from each of these blobs, um, which we can use to make a decision. So we look at things like the size and the shape. Um, we extract some so-called features or descriptors that then allow us to characterize these blobs and then make a decision on whether it's a broccoli or not. So the penultimate state is classification or decision making. So we actually have to train a, a classifier which makes a binary decision. Is it a broccoli or is it not? And so here you can see the outputs of this. Um, these different blobs of stuff have been, have been numbered and the ones that have been classified as broccoli heads, correctly in this case, are all, are all marked in red. And then finally what we can do then is having detected and uh, um, located the broccoli in a single frame of data, we can then track frame by frame. And that, that's important because that makes the system more robust and it also allows us to precisely pinpoint the location of the broccoli um, so then we'd be able to control an actuator and, and cut, cut them and remove them. So if we can just start the video then, please, and you'll see, you'll see the way the system works. So you can see on the top left the, the, the feed from the, from the Kinect camera, the different steps of processing. You can see the, the floor removal and, and, and the classification. And here at the bottom we can see the results of the tracking algorithm. Um, so you can see basically we're able to um, track the location of the objects and build a so-called map. Um, and here you can see that it, it makes a few mistakes, there's a double detection there, but overall it works pretty well. Um, so basically the final output of this system is, is a geo-referenced, if you like, map um, where we know um, which broccoli have been detected and where they are. Okay, thank you very much. If I can just go back to the presentation then. Um, so that, that's an overview of our, of our broccoli, um, broccoli vision system. So, and there's one of the outputs. This is for the data from Lincolnshire. So you can see the kind of, um, you can see the, the plants that have been detected. There's one that's been missed there, although it, it, it might also be a missing head that's been harvested already. Um, okay, and overall, um, I won't bore you with the details, but basically we've, we've, we've trained this system on the data from UK and from Spain and a mix of the two, and then we've, we've cross-validated, meaning we've tested the system trained on the UK data, on the Spanish data, and so on. And what we found is it actually doesn't really matter which set of training data you, you train on. Uh, the performance is pretty similar, uh, whichever, whichever data set you use for training, which is good, so we know we've got a good model of what a broccoli should look like. Um, so the differences we see are in the testing of the system in the, are in the overall performance on the UK and, and the Spanish data. So for the UK data, we're getting about 95% accuracy overall, um, which is pretty good. For Spain, the accuracy is lower. It's about 80-something percent. And that's basically, we think that's down to the, um, well, the different growing conditions, a different variety. There's a lot more leaf on the, on the broccoli crop in, in Spain, which is, which is occluding or covering, um, covering the broccoli and making it very hard to recognize. Um, so our conclusion from this is that it's also variety dependent and I think for these future systems to be deployed um, we'll need to get the right varieties that, that as well as the right technology, um, you know, these things have to, be, um, have to work together uh, for us to be able to build a robust system. You might think how, how good is 95% and the problem is there no one's actually done a study of how good humans are at doing this so we don't actually know how well humans can do this but, but I, I would suggest that's pretty good. Um, the, and, and the thing is that humans tend to get bored, they tend to get ill, they tend to take holidays, whereas this is exactly the kind of um, 
repetitive tasks that robots are really good at and can keep going. Uh, and this kind of camera technology will even work in the dark. So, you know, potentially you could have these systems running 24-7 and doing broccoli harvesting at the, you know, at the right time of year. Okay, we also, just to cut a long short story short, we also um, measured physically the size of these heads and things um, so we could, see, we could see how well our algorithms were, were able to estimate the size of the heads because that's really important for the decision-making step. And again, again, I won't bore you with the details, but we've tried a number of different methods. And bearing in mind the, the camera's only getting a partial view of the crop, um, we get some pretty good results where you can see the linear relationship between the, the, the sizes estimated by our, S, our algorithm and the actual sizes of the crops on the ground. So the next steps for this are actually to take this technology and combine it with, uh, with, with robotic actuator technology to make a full harvesting solution. Um, so I can just show you a couple of concept designs. This is from colleagues in our engineering school um, for that. So th this is work in progress. We can see here, uh, step one is an actuator to remove the, the, the leaves. Um, step two is, an is another, is another uh, actuator to cut the crop um, and also remove it. That's the hard bit, actually. And then you can see a concept design for, uh, for a system there where you've got a large number, well, six of these robots mounted on the back of a tractor. So there you're going from a system where you've currently got uh, uh, one person driving the tractor and six workers. Potentially you could, well, let's say, really increase the productivity of the, of, of the workers because now you only need one person to drive the tractor. Yeah, so so um, ultimately, of course, the tractor could be driven autonomously as well. So, so there you go. So that's... Um, that's the work we've been doing on, on broccoli harvesting. Um, there's one thing I didn't tell you about that system, is the hard bit is the training. And actually, it took one person three days to train this system. And it was actually, uh, it was actually a, a, a sixth former, a farmer's son from, from Lincolnshire, who came in to do work experience. Um, so in other industries, you do work experience. You, you sweep the floor, you make the coffee. In, um, in robotics, you come and do work experience. In a robotics lab, you do data an annotation. So uh, Adam had to sit and look through hundreds of images, of so 3D images, and, and point out the broccoli plants. And then all of that data was used to train the system. So if we want to make these systems really useful, then we need to simplify and make this, this training process easier. So one of, one of the pieces of work we've been doing at Lincoln, it's ongoing work, is to make trainable vision systems. And that's really important that, that there's a human in the loop and the human's able to train the system. So you don't need a computer scientist to, to come to your farm to set it up with it for, a, for a new task. Ideally, the system should be trainable on the farm to work with a new crop or a, a new setup, whatever it is. Um, so this is an example I'm going to show you from... It was actually a system that was designed to grade potatoes, to look for potato diseases. That there's, this is a prototype system, and there's a bigger version of it that's being tested in, in, in the industry. And with this system, we were trying to recognize different types of defects that you get in potatoes. Um, so I've become a bit of an expert now. I know what black dot looks like and uh, common scab and things like this. Um, so the colleagues at Potato Council actually wanted to have a system that they could train um, to, to work with different types of blemishes. And they have new ones coming. They have new diseases coming along. Um, they want to be able to train the system and, and have it work and, and recognize different types of, of, of diseases. And this is post-harvest. But of course, if you could automate this technology, then you could potentially do this much closer to the harvesting operations. You could potentially do the grading in field. Um, so that, that would mean you could even potentially increase yields because you could make earlier decisions on uh, where, how to store different parts of the crop. And you might be able to um, stop uh, infectious diseases like uh, fungal infections or whatever at an earlier, earlier stage. Um, you know, so for a crop like broccoli, you could even do this quality assessment before you actually make the decision to harvest. Um, so basically, to, without going into details, we made a nice kind of graphical user interface where, where the, the user can basically scribble on the screen and say, this is good potato, this is disease A, this is blemish B, whatever, whatever it is you want it to learn. Um, and then the systems, the trained systems then able to use this knowledge um, to make decisions and, and basically give you a quality assessment for, um, for any new potatoes, any other potatoes you put into the system. So here, unfortunately, this is bad... Um, bad interface, we've used red to, for good potato. We should have probably used green for, for good potato. But you can see that, you know, in this case, the system's able to correctly classify the different types of blemishes on the, on the potato. Um, 
Yeah, so, so this is a, this is a, a technology that, that we think is really important. That you could, um, the reason why you need to do this with, with a trainable system um, and how agriculture is different from other industries, if you're in the automotive industry and, you, and you're making a machine vision system to inspect car parts, it's a lot easier because they come in standardised shapes and sizes. But um, potatoes, whatever, like, they're a bit like us. They're unique individuals. Um, and I was talking to a, a, a grower of seed potatoes in Scotland who I think was in the, has got a world record for growing 667 varieties of potatoes on the same land. You cannot make a vision system that will work for every kind of, uh, every, every kind of potato or any kind of crop. Uh, so as an example, um, white potatoes, when they get too much sunlight, they go green, but red potatoes go black. So if you make a vision system that works for white potatoes, it won't work for red potatoes. Um, so making a system trainable is really key to being able to adapt to the, to the changing conditions, different varieties, new treatments, whatever. Okay, so uh, I've, I've talked about two examples of our work. I'm just going to talk briefly about a third one, and then I'll, I'll talk about some, uh, briefly about some on, ongoing work and wrap up. Um, I'll just check how I'm doing for time. Okay, I've got about six, minute left, six minutes left, so I better speed up a bit. Um, so, basically, this is another project just to demonstrate that we can do uh, robot control as well. So, this, this is an example of a, of a sprayer, and it has um, really long sprayer booms, which are spraying um, whatever treatments onto the crop. Um, so, the current systems have to try to level uh, the sprayer booms to keep them at a certain height above the crop. If the height's uh, too high or too low, then, then the process becomes inefficient, and you can get drift of chemicals or whatever into, into other, other fields. Um, so the problem is that's a really difficult control problem because it's a great big um, yeah, mechanical thing that, that, that's sort of balanced on a, like a pendulum. So what we did to, to, to make this, to, to, um, to do this, is we put a, a laser scanner on, front of the, on the front of the cab of the sprayer. So this is actually a 2D laser scanner that's scanning a line about 10 meters in front of the vehicle. Um, and then we're using that to kind of build a scrolling 3D model of the scene which we're then using to plan trajectories and control the, 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 the arms or the booms of the sprayer. Um, so I won't go into too many details, but this is a 3D map that's been acquired of a, this was actually a field um, in, in February, I think, when there was only five centimeters of stubble on the ground. It's kind of color coded by height, so the red bits are, are, are higher, the, the blue bits are lower. And, and you can see that even with this very limited amount of, um, amount of crop there, you, you can clearly see um, the, the, the tram lines and even the turning circle of the vehicle. So, so we get a very accurate 3D model of the, of the scene, and then we're able to then use this to develop a robot controller. So we basically have a, a model of the system that we're trying to control. This, this is the kinematics, or if you like, the, the physics of the, of the sprayer boom. And then we're able to do, um, we do trajectory pl planning. So uh, we look ahead and we, we we plan how to move the, the trajectory, sorry, move the sprayer booms to uh, avoid any um, bumps in the ground or move, move up and down depending on the changes in the terrain or the crop. Um, and then just a, an example, you can see where, um, where there's, there's, a, there's an obstacle there and the sprayer boom's tilting um, to, to, to avoid uh, hitting that particular object. Um, so I think that's basically, that's my third example of a project and, that, and that, that's ongoing work. Um, so finally, I'll just mention a few other projects that we're doing at University of Lincoln right now. So we have a project on robot weeding, and this is with, this is with a company called Garford Farm Machinery, um, who are world-leading experts in building vision-guided hoeing systems. Uh, it's great because I can tell people I work on robot hoes. Um, and yeah, so this, um, this is basically a camera-guided uh, uh, robotic system for removing weeds mechanically, so there's no spraying going on. Um, so, we, so that's the kind of thing we're working on now. They've been doing this very successfully for 20 years, and, and we're now helping them to develop next generation systems that will use 3D sensing uh, uh, and so on. Um, just to mention other, other streams of work, we're working on, on this, this logistics. I mean, mobile robots that, that I work with, are, they're really good at one thing, and that's getting from A to B. Um, so why not use them to carry things, move them around? So we do work on both infield transportation and logistics as well. So just to highlight a new project that we've just started at the University of Lincoln, together with colleagues from, from Norwegian University of Life Sciences and uh, Berry Gardens, a uh, uh, major company there. Um, we're building an infill transportation system for, for strawberry production. 
So we're not actually trying to do what it said in the Financial Times the other day. We're not trying to um, pick the crop. Um, what we're trying to do is, is assist the humans that are picking the crop by carrying the boxes of strawberries. So actually, on, on the way that these production systems work at the moment, the humans working on the, f the farm, the skilled pickers, are actually spending between 20 and 40% of their time carrying the boxes of picked fruit from A to B. So that's something that actually a mobile robot could do, um, do just as well, well, we think. So there we're trying to not replace the humans, but we're trying to work alongside the humans, so the humans spend more time picking and the robots spend, uh, spend their time transporting the crop. And we're going to be building... Um, well, we've got some polytunnels going up at our uh, research facility at the Riseham campus, and, and we're going to be working on that system there. Um, so, and this system will be using some of the technologies that I showed you earlier, like the people tracking technology, because if you're going to work together with people and an environment with humans, you need to know where the people are and not kill them. Yeah. So, um, last but not least, we've got a, a new European project as well with a number of partners, which is to develop similar technologies, but for warehouses. Um, so we've got a project with partners from Sweden and, and Germany and Italy um, to build the next generation of warehousing systems and we're building, if you like, smart forklift trucks. So again, this will be an environment where there'll be a mixture of humans and robotic systems working together and, and we'll do some of the software technology to make these uh, forklifts aware of their surroundings, aware of what the people are doing and, and able to work together with people to increase the productivity, increase the efficiency of warehousing operations. Okay, so um, that's the end of the sort of case studies that I wanted to, pr to present. Um, just to mention briefly other bits of strands of work that are ongoing and new things I didn't have time to mention. Um, well, we've always been interested in robot mapping. We want robots be to be able to map anything, basically, know what the stuff is and, and where it is in the world. Um, I think there's a general trend, uh, especially for um, crops like vegetables and beets and things, to, to go towards per plant operations. So, so being able to identify and measure properties of individual plants and then to be able to use this for applications like selective spraying, weeding, selective harvesting, some of the examples we talked about. We're also very, I think as well as monitoring the, the health and quality of the crop, there'll be increasing um, interest in future on, on monitoring the, the quality and the health of the soil as well. So we've got projects, for example, uh, measuring soil moisture, as I mentioned. Um, so that's my timer telling me that I've I've run out of time, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finish off. So we're measuring other soil properties as well, like compaction, conductivity, microbial signature. Um, we're also working on in-field transportation logistics, and, and we've got some new projects starting in robotic manipulation for picking fruit. A new colleague, um, Professor Gerhard Neumann, who's, who's a, a specialist in robotic manipulation. So finally then, this is my, this is my last slide. I'm going to draw my conclusions. So I hope, hope this has given you an interesting overview of some of the technologies that we're developing at the moment and the future direction of travel, um, where this technology can go. As I said, I think these, these systems will be deployed firstly on existing agricultural vehicles, but then I think on, on a longer term we can, we can hope to see um, smaller robotic systems that, that will do some of these tasks. And hopefully we can get from the general purpose tractor to the general purpose robot on the farm that, that can do lots of jobs on the farm. So for me, as a, as a researcher in computer science and autonomous systems, I think they're an excellent enabling technology for precision ag agriculture. Um, I think it's important to note, however, that robots and hu humans are good at different things. So I don't think it's a case of, of robots replacing humans. It's a case of robots helping humans to become more productive and hopefully providing more interesting work for them as well. Um, so I think we'll go from agricultural machines to robot co-workers. So it might be that the farmer of the future is something like a, like a shepherd with a flock of robots. Um, I think I, we're not going to see full autonomy just yet. I think um, it's very important, actually, that we have a human in the loop, especially if we need someone to train the system or, or to, to supervise and, and look after the system. So, for example, the person that's driving the tractor on, 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 the, uh, on the farm might also be the one that's training it to recognise broccoli or whatever the job may be. And I think it's essential that all of these systems are able to self-improve. They're able to learn from their experience. And that, that's really key, I think, and that's the glue, if you like, that holds all this stuff together. I think that's, that's a really core, core thing that, that we as computer scientists need to develop for, for the agricultural robotics uh, systems to work. Um, so that, that's just about it. I just, just want to acknowledge the people that have, have done this research and, and the people we've worked with. And then finally, just to say, if, you, if we're currently looking for people for projects, we're looking for new lecturers, new postdoctoral researchers, new PhD students. So if, if you know anyone that might be interested, uh, please send them our way. Um, that, that's, that's about it from me, so um, thank you very much.
Thanks very much, Professor Duckett. Um, before I introduce our second speaker, I just want to remind you of the Slido app. So if, you've, if, that's, if what you've heard so far is prompting some questions, please do go to Slido, www.sli.do, and put in your questions. If you're in the audience here in particular, please do say who you are and indicate the fact you're here in the audience, and I'll get you to ask your question um, at the end when we have the Q&A. Um, I also mentioned that we're doing polls on Slido, and uh, uh, James put a poll up on the screen, but I didn't actually introduce it. So here's the poll. I can see quite a few of you who have already voted. So the poll, first poll question was, how would you rate the current importance of automated technology and associated software as part of your business? So uh, today, how important is it? Um, so if you haven't already voted, either here in the audience or uh, watching on the internet, can you vote now and we'll come back and look at the final results of that in the Q&A. Okay, I'd like to introduce our second speaker. So we've heard about some of the technologies that are being developed uh, in, in, in the area of robotics and automation. Uh, we're now going to hear Professor Simon Pearson, who's also from, uh, uh, from the University of, uh, of Lincoln. Who's going, he's the founding director of the Lincoln Institute of Agri-Food Technology. And that department, I think he's probably going to talk a bit more about what it does, but it pulls together some of the expertise across lots of different departments in the university uh, that, that, that all come to bear, that could be brought to bear on the area of farm, farming and food production. Um, on, ongoing work uh, with Professor Pearson's team include projects on agri-robotics, including the development of robotic harvesting machinery and fleets of small autonomous field robots and numerous applications of robotics in food processing environments. So please again give a warm welcome to Professor Simon Pearson. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this opportunity to come and talk to you. That's, um and thanks, Tom. So we, we had to sort of sort out our slides, and uh, I'm, I'm sure Tom got most of mine. <laughs> so um, what I've been asked to do is really think uh, three or four uh, technologies which may shape agriculture in the future. And what I was asked to do is really sort of think about what's going to shape farming in around, by about 2030. So you think 2030 is about 13 years away. So what I'm going to do is just pitch in about four ideas uh, about, about the future of farming, what farming may, might look like. Um, before I do that, I just want to just mention uh, a little bit about uh, my little institute, so it's uh, abbreviated LIAT, uh, Lincoln Institute of Agri-Food Technology. And Lincoln, uh, we're a relatively new university, so we've been around for about 15 years, but clearly being in the middle of Lincolnshire, agriculture and food is a pretty big theme at the university. We don't have a school of, uh, of agriculture as such, uh, we have the institute, uh, but within the uh, university we have a very big college of science, and in the college of science, it's a very classic college of science, we've got core schools of computer science, which Tom's from, engineering, chemistry, National Centre for Food Manufacturing, maths, physics, life science, geography. And all I do, and my team do, is really network uh, amongst the, uh, my colleagues in the college, and then network with industry and match projects. And, uh, and uh, so we're a very small institute, but we have quite a big impact in the university. And uh, to date, about 25% of all of the academic staff in the College of Science at the University of Lincoln are researching agri-food technology. So we've leveraged the entire uh, college uh, via the use of, uh, of, of LIAT. So uh, agri-food in Lincoln is a very, very big thing. What I want to do is, before I uh, uh, talk about the, the, the farm of the future, I just want to talk a bit about the farm of today. And I've just pulled up a few um, statistics, just to give a, 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 a flavour on, uh, on, on the state of farming. Uh, and I've used the latest data set from the Farm Business Survey just to uh, give you an indication of the state of farming. And uh, we're talking about arable farming here, and I just want to just reflect on some of these things. So in the Farm Business Survey, the, the net uh, profit uh, for, for cereal farmers 2014, 15 and 15, 16 was £45,000 and £35,000. Um, but the devil's really in the detail and uh, what the Farm Business Survey shows is how this profitability is, is, is derived. And a very big proportion of cereal farming profit is from the basic payment scheme. 
diversifying income, so that's, um, that's uh, other energy businesses or shops, uh, etc., uh, is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a relatively large lump. Agri-environment schemes is a small lump, but there's a real issue here. This is agriculture. This is the profit from core agricultural activity, i.e. growing crops, and in these two years, arable farming was making a loss. So that's not a healthy uh, position to start with. Um, it's a little bit better in horticulture, general cropping a bit better, uh, and very variable in terms of sort of animal uh, production as well. So it's a bit of a concern. We're going into Brexit. We don't know what the new British agriculture policy is going to be, and the core activity of farming is, uh, is not showing a, 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 a huge amount of profitability. Um, the devil's in the detail, though. So what I've done here is, again, from the Farm Business Survey, it's just taken out the cost of production of a tonne of wheat amongst their entire survey. And this shows the cost of production. So these are uh, less than £100. And then you've got some farms which are producing wheat at, at, uh, at, at over £250 a tonne. So if anybody knows the price of wheat, that's not a very sustainable business to, uh, to be had. Uh, and this, this cut here... Is, is, the, is the profitable farms, and this is the not profitable farms. You can see about 50% within the farm business survey of uh, farms are not profitable. So what does that mean? We've got to really drive productivity uh, 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 as hard as we possibly can. Driving productivity, you could, you could say, well, I'll increase yield, but what I've shown here is just the yield data from DEFRA uh, of the British wheat crop, and you can see it's, it's ranging, this is from 1880, it's a wonderful data set. Uh, nothing really happens until the Second World War. Uh, then we get uh, herbicides, more mechanization, uh, plant breeding's coming in up here, pesticides are coming in up here, and then it gets to about uh, 1990, then starts to level off. And then it also starts to get much more variable. Uh, why this variability is increasing, we don't know. It might be weather, it might be all sorts of things that we're doing to the agricultural system. But it is a concern that we're starting to see this, this plateau. So is yield going to get us out of this predicament? Uh, it, it may do, but if you're a betting person, you've really got to bet on driving productivity as a priority if history is dictating that, that yield is, is, uh, is, is plateauing off. So productivity is going to be all important. Uh, back to productivity again. Uh, it's, the agriculture sector doesn't have a huge uh, a reputation within the British economy. This is data from the o Office of National Statistics 2016 and shows that agriculture has got the lowest productivity of any industry in the UK. Food is slightly better, but there's a, there is a productivity uh, 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 issue in, uh, in farming. Why that into the future uh, and Brexit? So the AHDB last year estimated that about 115,000 people are employed in UK agriculture. I actually think that underestimates. Of those 22,000 are EU migrants. That's full-time employees, uh, um, uh, all-year-round employees. And then 67,000 seasonal workers. So uh, that's a very large number of people. If you add in the extra 135,000 in the food sector, you can see that there's going to be, uh, uh, there's a lot of people, uh, and if we restrict uh, 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 movement of people post-Brexit, there's going to be a big challenge. Hence why we're really focusing on uh, agri-robotics at Lincoln, particularly around the produce sector, where a large number of these people are, 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 are required, and also in the food sector, uh, where a large number of these people are required. So robotics is going to be a key enabling technology. Uh, and then there's, there's other issues, and this is the famous uh, video which uh, Tom, Tom mentioned. Uh, uh, this, is, this is not myself or Tom driving that thing. Uh, this is some poor guy in Norway once again. But you can see the, these, these situations are, are real-life uh, uh, situations. Difficult to go home and explain what you've done there, isn't it? <laughs> so, but, so why is that? Well, uh, everyone's worried about soil health, quite rightly so. This is some data from Rothamsted. This shows the soil organic carbon from arable farming since 1950, and it's generally uh, decreasing. Um, it's not irreversible. If you put grass back, soil carbon builds very slowly. It builds at a slower rate than you lose it. So, so there, are, there is a general concern about uh, soil health, and we need technologies to, to deal with some of these situations. 
Right, so, uh, but it's not all gloom, and I think Tom's given some inspiration uh, uh, for, the, for the future. And uh, what I would say is we are in the middle of what I call the fourth uh, agricultural revolution, and that's really digital technology. And uh, one of the big enabling technologies of the future will be digital technology. That includes robotics, connecting data sources, connectivity, use of data, bioinformatics, in internet of things, artificial intelligence, machine learning, autonomy. All these technologies are going to be underpinning for the future. Um, so, but what are the game-changing technologies? And uh, I've got uh, uh, my first two technology. One, I'm going to say autonomous vehicles. Tom's given a great talk on, on autonomy, and, uh, and I'm not going to talk about agricultural autonomy. I'm going to show a little video in a minute just showing the rate of change of technology development behind autonomy, really to prove my point that I think autonomy is going to be key because the rate of change of autonomous vehicles in, in general industry over the last 13 years has been phenomenal, so we don't know what's going to happen in the next 13 years. And then I'm going to talk, and I'm going to show a little video which just shows my which will be interoperable uh, autonomous vehicles providing real-time information, the connected farm. Uh, now, uh, again, when you see this video, this is a, you're going to see a clip of some military technology. Uh, but what, what I want you to think about when you see this clip is uh, uh, how can that military technology be used in the farming situation? In the military technology, uh, you'll have a, a, a complex um, set of autonomous sensors which are sensing the battlefield and providing uh, information to, to, uh, to people to, 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 to effect decisions. The key thing about military technology is it relies on a very large number of sensors which are all interoperable. Um, okay, we'll come on to this in a sec. So, this little video, the, the, the music I did for it is from 2004, just to put you back in the uh, picture in 2000. This is the Garpa Grand Challenge. Broken. Oh, that's like a moonwalker thing. And these uh, these vehicles had to travel, I think, 100 miles over from the Harvey Desert. Des this is a good one. Look at this guy. Oh, So, so uh, in the DARPA Grand Challenge of 2000, not one autonomous vehicle made it. Wind up 13 years, uh, 13 years uh, to 2017, and then you've got this. And what I want you to think about is, is, the, is the, the rate that, that that technology has developed. So that's a control system on a Tesla car completely hands-free. That's happened in 13 years. So I've got no doubt uh, uh, it, that if we wind that clock forward into agriculture, we're going to see some very tremendous developments in the next 13 years. So what will happen in the next 13 years? So another example that's farming tomorrow, it's here today, and this is the, the military technology I want to show you about connecting multiple sensors. Uh, this is a, a Royal Navy um, uh, material. There was an exercise in 2016, had 50 uh, UAVs from 20 nations, all different uh, sensors and uh, devices, and they're all interoperable. This is groundbreaking. This is completely new. It's enhancing what we've got. It's really innovative. It's been fantastically exciting.
No longer are the militaries of the world the only people who in some way owned technology development. It is easy for our adversaries to access, it is cheap, it is proliferating around the world. How do we continue to operate in a 21st century maritime battle space in order to maintain a warfighting cutting edge? The capability offered by unmanned and increasingly autonomous technology is advancing at a rapid rate. Unmanned vehicles are doing things that have never been done before, creating new possibilities, challenging the way we operate. But can they work together? Can they give our operational commanders a better understanding of their environment and a competitive edge? Can they reduce the risks faced by our armed forces? And can they perform in the real world, a harsh and unforgiving environment? From here, Unmanned Warrior was born. So, so the point is the military is now integrating multiple UAVs. Uh, this is what farming needs, will do in the future. So uh, in farming at the moment, we'll have a, um, an environment space where we've got a whole range of sensors. Uh, this is a, a source from Bayer, so you might have satellite sensors, UAVs, uh, other, other devices measuring crops, uh, communication systems, weather systems, uh, biophysical models. Uh, and what we need to do is integrate all of these technologies together into one data control system for decision support. That, I think, is one of the future uh, technologies for farming. And my point is, is that that's used in the military today. So by 2030, I do expect to see that in farming. I don't think at the moment one of these technologies on its own provides the information that we need to have a comprehensive view of the farming system. And it's the, it's the integration of all these systems which will be the, the key step. Interoperability is going to be key. And, uh, and, uh, and the way that data is transferred from one machine to another will be, uh, will be key. So. Uh, uh, game changer uh, uh, number uh, three, uh, I've got robot ready farms uh, and also electric farms and new genetics, which, so robot ready, which is underpinned by electric farms and new genetics. This is a wonderful picture here. This idea of electric farms is not a, uh, it's not a new idea. This is from the University of Reading, 1955, uh, and this is uh, uh, the, the, one of the first ever electric farms. And this little poor chap here is wired up to a 400 volt cable. <laughs> it's praying it doesn't rain or there's a lightning strike. There's something pretty cloudy going on here. I don't know whether he survived that very long. So the idea of electric farms is, uh, is, not, is not a new idea, but I think we're going to have a better realisation of, of, of that. Uh, when I say electric farms, I, I think it's already here. Um, and this is uh, just a, a little clip from John Deere of an electric tractor, one of the first ones. And I'll just show you this. Uh, and here you go. So John did. So this, this thing's got a life of about three hours. And basically, that's just a huge block of AA batteries, more or less. Uh, and I've got no doubt that, that, that electric is going to be one of the game changers of the future. It's got a long way to go. We need innovations in battery technology uh, and control systems. But it's CO2 neutral, emission three. Here we go. An incredibly high torque. So each of these wheels has got its own, uh, own, own, own motor. I can't remember the horsepower of these things, Paul, but it's, it's really, really pretty terrific. So electric uh, farms and electric vehicles, I think, will be uh, key. I'll keep going. Uh, and then the other part of robot ready farms will be genetics. As Tom mentioned, broccoli harvesting. This is some uh, broccoli harvesters in, uh, in uh, California. What you see is that conventional varieties in California, you can't see the, the crop. And as Tom mentioned, um, uh, one of the reasons why uh, the, our training set in Spain was, was, uh, uh, was not as, as good as our training set in the UK, was you get all these problems with occlusions and leaves. Uh, what we're going to see is a transformation of plant genetics, uh, which will be robot ready. So this variety has been specifically bred, uh, really with, with automated harvesting in mind. 
uh, and you're going to see a lot of the, these innovations coming through, particularly in the produce area. And you see this, this, this variety, it's a, a, a seminist variety, uh, it's upright, it's standing, it's very easy to recognise with the camera system, there's no occlusions, and these are the crops of the future that we're going to see. So it won't be just, it won't just be uh, a robotics engineering solutions, there'll be a combination with, with genetics and, and conventional plant breeding. Then my final slide, so what are the game change technologies for, for 2030? I just thought I'd throw this in. Uh, will farmers exist? Are we going to be here? There's lots in the news about uh, urban farms, so this idea of growing crops indoors using LED lights and uh, controlled atmosphere systems. Um, so, um, uh, so, so my question is, will farms exist? Uh, the good news is on this, and uh, I've just run some costing models uh, plant physiology data, and uh, the good news for any wheat farm of a uh, kilo of wheat in an urban farm is over £100 a hundred pound a kilo. So, so I think you boys who are growing cereals are twenty thirty. Uh, uh, however, anyone growing lettuce, you, you, you know, this is per cost. This. Really electricity, and it's 63p. Resources. This has got real potential. This is going to happen, uh, but you're pretty safe with your wheat. So, uh, so you don't need to sell it. Worrying about urban farm on wheat. Uh, and that's that's really it. So those are my four uh, my my four predictions for the future. <laughs> okay. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor... Oh, sorry, that was a bit loud. Thank you very much, Professor Pearson. OK, um, we're going to have a 10-minute comfort break now while we reset the stage, and I'm going to then ask Professor Duckett and Professor Pearson to join me back on the stage for a QA. and a I've seen, been looking at the questions at the back. We've got some good questions coming in. That's good. You've still got a chance to add your questions, both if you're here in the audience and if you're watching on the internet. Please do put your name on, especially if you're here in the audience, and indicate the fact that you're here, and then I'll get you to ask your question personally. Uh, on the stage. Uh, so then we'll break for, for 10 minutes, uh, chance to get, get another drink and a, and, a, and a nibble, and then we'll reconvene here to hear the Q&A, and then finally to hear a speaker from St. Jen's to talk about some of the exciting things that are happening in the here and now that you can apply on your farm today. Thanks very much. So see you in 10 minutes.
thanks very much for getting back so promptly. I, we're here back on stage. We've got Professor Simon Pearson, Professor Tom Ducker, Duckett. Duckett. Duckett, sorry. I've pr mispronounced it three different ways already this evening. Um, and I have my magic bouncing, actually not bouncing, throwing <coughs> microphone ball here ready, ready for action. Um, but before we kick off with some questions, I just want to look at the results of the poll. So earlier on we asked you uh, about your current, uh, how you viewed automation currently. The question was, how would you rate the current importance of automated technology and associated software as part of your business? And it looks like maybe, as you might expect from an audience interested in coming to an event about farming technology, that a fairly high proportion of you, 46%, say it's important you already use it frequently. So is that when you're talking to farmers about this sort of technology and its adoption, how do you find, what sort of reception do you get? Are they sceptical, are they cynical, or are they sort of quite enthusiastic about adopting the technology? Uh, it depends on the sector. So um, the, the sector that's, that's really engaged is the fresh produce sector. So particularly on robotics. Um, uh, so it's all about Brexit, migrant labour, availability of people. Uh, and that's not just, and that's a worldwide thing. So when we travel around the world, it's always about that the biggest number one is, is fresh produce. And uh, although in the UK we've got, um, got Brexit, in America you've got Donald Trump and Mexican labour. In Japan you've got, uh, you've got aging farmers, no netting with migration. In China you've got a very aging demographic. So, so around very high labour use areas with lots and lots of people, particularly picking fresh produce it's a very very high level of engagement um, I think in arable area it's coming so um, and uh, I think there's huge interest I think people need, know that they've got to drive productivity uh, they, they've got to, they've got to be more uh, e efficient and I think there's a lot of people who are very interested in technologies as enabling technologies so so arable's a little bit behind I think uh, in terms of the farmers mentality uh, but it's it's coming and I think with the rate of change of, of technology, particularly when we start to integrate all these devices, uh, uh, th then, then it's really going to happen. So we're not, we're not quite there yet, but we, you can see it quite quickly. Tom, do you want to add anything? Um, I, I, I've really not got a lot to add to that. Um, so usually I speak to people who are very interested already, but that's because Simon and his team have done a good job in, in, in getting us to speak to the people that are interested in the first place. I mean, from, from my experience, it's, 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 um, we've had a really positive reception from, from companies that we work with. Um, so some of the agricultural machinery uh, makers, so people like Garford Farm Machinery, House and Sprayers that we work with on, on projects, we found that they're very positive towards us, the technology. <coughs> so yeah, my, my experience is the positive. Okay, let's uh, take our first question from the audience. And I'm keeping my fingers crossed that the names I've got here are people who actually are in the audience today. Uh, so the first question, I'm going to call is from Nick Rainsley. Nick, are you in the audience? Yeah, excellent. Now, how good are you at catching, Nick? Let's try this. Here we go. Excellent. <laughs> I mean, you've got the question up there anyway on the screen, but with the increasing levels of robotics, uh, networks, cloud-based computer systems, all this sort of stuff on farm, how is that data going to be shared? Because at the moment, networks, 3G, 4G, I mean, I live in rural Norfolk and it's a, it's a real scream. Um, how do you see that developing to actually even start to, to keep pace with what we have now, let alone looking at this technology going forward? Good question. Is this all going to be stymied by the lack of good connectivity on farm? Um. Maybe, maybe not. Um, I mean, it depends. Will we get 5G technology sometime soon? Apparently, then, then this could be an, an, an enabler. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, uh, um, it, is, it is an issue, and it's, it, it, it will be uh, uh, an issue. The challenge for the technology developers is really to sort of do as much onboard processing of information on the actual machine and then to minimise what's transferred back. Um, so, you know, so some of these uh, digital streams, particularly 3D point cloud data, it's huge. Yep, yep. And there's just absolutely no way you could transmit that back, even with a very, very high speed uh, broadband system. So it'll be processing high speed on, on the fly and then really minimizing the data flow back. And that, and that, that will be a, that will be a, 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 a challenge. Yep. 
Good, so, but I can see there are technologies like that that so minimise the amount of data that needs to be transferred and maybe can buffer it so that you only have to send it, you can send it when you get the good connectivity because I know it can vary across fields as well, can't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. So and the, 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 the computer crunch processing power required is also huge, isn't it? It's Absolutely. So, so I think, as you say, there'll be a, a, a growing trend towards distributed arch architectures where rather than having a central processing unit, you've got computing embedded in the, the devices, the different machinery on the farm, in the robots. Um, so you can have quite low bandwidth communications. I, I think there's also a, a role for aggregating all this data over time so that when you deploy um, a robot on a farm, wherever it may be, it can take advantage of all the, all the other robots and all of their experience. So, you know, I, I, th I think, I wouldn't think that um, lack of bandwidth is a showstopper. I think there are, there are ways uh, to adapt to this. Good, and that's a question that we get a lot on Farms Weekly. Right, do you want to try and throw it back to me, Nick? <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you so far. This is going to go horribly wrong at some moment, I know. Okay, the next question I want to call is from someone I know is in the audience because I was speaking to him earlier, Andrew Ward. Uh, some of you might know him on Twitter as Wheat Daddy. Ah, <laughs> you're nice and close, that's good. Yeah, um, it's on the screen again, but can robots help us protect a decreasing food production, production toolbox and assure the public we are producing food while caring for nature and the environment? Because, yeah, technology, science and technology is hugely important. But if we haven't got the tools in that toolbox to produce food, can robots and, and this sort of automation help us do that? And will it assure the public that what we're trying to do is produce safe food and not poison them? Absolutely. And I think, I think this kind of electric uh, low-power systems that we're talking about, um, you could potentially have, they could be potentially... Um, energy self-sufficient that you, all the all the energy you need you you, you know you, you have solar panels you have um, anaerobic digesters on the farm that, that we could we could have a circular economy where um, you know where, where we're not reliant on on fossil fuels where we, we have systems that are, are able to work in a more sustainable way yeah uh, I, I, I I think a great example of a, a really positive is is robotic weeding where, where, where you're actually using mechanical hoe to, to kill the weeds, so, instead, so, of, instead, instead, of the instead of the chemicals. Yeah. So, so I, I think there's lots of uh, there's there's lots of really positive environmental benefits, uh, particularly anything that drives productivity. So yield per metre squared, because you've got better information, better control. That's all got to be a, a, a very good thing because your environmental impact per unit of production should drop as your productivity go go goes up. So, lots of benefits. I think I think the, the thing we've got to be really careful about is this 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 perception about robots replacing people, um, that's, that's a concern. It, it's, uh, uh, my experience though, talking farming industry, is, is that wh where we are with robotics, it's about robots doing jobs that people now don't really want to do or they're not available. So, so I, don't, I don't see a threat uh, from robots in terms of replacing people because the jobs that we're trying to get these robots to do uh, are pretty low paid, difficult, uh, in, uh, in difficult circumstances, wet, horrible jobs, yeah. and monotonous jobs. So, 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 so it's very important, though, that we've got a responsibility just to keep that message going through to the public. And what we don't want to do is, with robots, have another situation, the GM debate, where, where the whole debate got a little bit out of control, and then the public went against the technology. That would be, that would be poor. So we've all got a responsibility just to, to keep that in, in everybody's mind. I mean, still on the, sa on the same theme of that, are you having any communication or contact um, with Friends of the Earth or, or the Soil Association, you know, s looking at, at promoting or helping what, uh, and promoting what they're doing, if you like, and what they say we should be doing? Uh, we, we, we talk to people like the Environment Agency, Natural England, all those organisations, yeah. not, with, not with Friends of the Earth yet. Um, uh, environment agencies see lots of benefits because you, uh, where, we, where we're using robots is to do environmental monitoring. So it might be soil moisture monitoring, it might be environmental monitoring. So you're using a, you can get a much higher quality of data through the application of robotics than you would otherwise. So, um, uh, so, 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 you know, so far a very positive reception because those agencies also see it as a key enabling technology. It's collecting the data, then it's humans then decide what they're gonna do with the data. But, but at least you've got a platform to collect the data. 
Actually, can I add a question to that? Because I, I know that one of the things that gets people quite excited about some of these technologies is that they can, in principle, help us to improve or reduce the environmental impact of the way we farm. And one of the ways it could do that is by helping us to be much more precise in the way that we apply some of these inputs. Yeah. Now, do you think there's scope not only to, 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 to improve the, the imp reduce the impact on the environment, but maybe to put together an argument to say some of, the, some of the inputs that we've lost over the last few years, maybe we could review, because if we can use them more precisely, then the, 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 the justification for taking them out of our arsenal may no longer be relevant if we no longer are spreading them you know, into the soil as well, if we can apply them exactly on the leaf where they're needed. Uh, absolutely, I, I, I fully agree. I think the challenge at the moment is we don't have the information to give, to, to give the level of precision we might, might want. That will, that will e evolve. Uh, I think where, where we underestimate is, is how complex farming is and, and crop responses are. So it's, 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 it's such a complicated thing because you've got so many variables. You've got soils, varieties, uh, pesticides, herbicides, you know, the, the, the whole thing's interacting in a complex way. Mm -hmm. What we are going to see is, is, I think, machine learning to unravel all that complexity. So it's just incomprehensible for a human to understand how crops grow. Uh, I mean, period. I don't, you know, I'll, I'll anybody who, who thinks they know better, then, then I'd be really surprised. It's incomprehensible. But, but the great thing about machine learning is, for the first time, I think we might be able to, if we've got enough data, start to unravel some of these complexities. And then that's when precision agriculture is really going to take off because we can then really start to target things in a proper way, which is considered many more variables than we've done in the past. So, you know, machine learning, and with human in the loop as well, is going to be key. Not there yet, but that will come. Andrew, would you like to pass the ball one place to your left? Because I know that Rhonda, sitting right next to you, also has a question. I think it'd be safe because Rhonda's ball control skills are probably a bit <laughs> questionable, so she'll catch that. I hope she's a good thrower <laughs> in a moment. <laughs> disappeared now. Um, sorry, my question's disappeared. It was to do with about helping vegetable yes, producers um, facing labour issues. It, it was, I was particularly interested in the broccoli harvester and the, the technology that's bringing into the field, bearing in mind lots of our vegetable producers in the country are very twitchy now with Brexit and EU migrant labour. Um, whether you could see this as being the solution to their problems going forward and when do you think it's likely to be widely available for them? Yeah, timing's the key here, isn't mm. it? Is it going to come early enough to help some of the challenges we see in the near future? We hope so. We can try. Um, you know, we, we need to have the right partners to work with. We need, we need to work with the right companies that, that are, will help us to translate the technologies that we're, we're working on to, to really work in the field, and that, that's, that's critical, I think. Um, you know, the, the, I think in the academic world, we talk about um, high technology readiness levels. We, we, we're working with basic research and then we, we need to translate that and, and make it work in the real world so you know um, and to do that we need to work with companies and, and we need to work with private sector we need to work with the, with the right people to help us turn those solutions into into real systems I mean I mean I think this is where um, if you look at other other areas of automation I'm actually quite optimistic about agriculture because if you look at um, there's a lot of hype now about autonomous driving and, and cars and things but actually if you think about um, driving you're, you're on a you know a road where there are, there are cars passing each other at 60 miles an hour um, very close to each other um, that's a very difficult environment to be making autonomous decisions in um, but whereas if you talk about a tractor in, in a field in, in the middle of a field driving at 10, mil, 10 miles an hour I think that, that's a, from a technology perspective that's that's a, that's a low-hanging fruit that's that's a much more realistic target to go for so I, I, I really think you'll see this robotic systems in a, in a five to ten year horizon for, for, for operations that you, you, you're talking about, broccoli harvesting for example. I think you know, we've got the, the building blocks, we kind of know roughly how to do it, now we need to fine tune that and, and turn it into real, real systems. Yeah, yeah I, I think there'll be some very quick, I think broccoli harvesting will be probably one of the quick wins. Uh, I mean the whole world's energised around it, this is, I say it's not a UK problem, it's a worldwide thing. Uh, and you know, plant breeders as well are also united around it. So, so what, I, what I really hope we see a coming together of all these technologies, genetics, breeding, the, the, the whole lot with robotics, and that will be part of the solution. So uh, if I had a cap, uh, if, uh, if, I, if I was going to have a bet, two, three years, something like that. Uh, That's pretty optimistic, fantastic. On that one. 
Other ones are much more difficult. Thank so, you. so. Let's see if I can catch from you, Rhonda. Well, I was ace to play before you. Very good. Okay, Lee Morris. Are you here? Ah, fantastic. Nice yeah, and close again. Sure. Um, thank you. My question's it, 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 it's based around students, but actually it's more about, well, it is about science communication and technology transfer. Y your 13 years was a figure you put in. You've just got it down to three. So currently students that have started already, in terms of future-proofing for the sector, I'm sure students at Lincoln University are all over this, and you're undergrads, right. but there's 68 land-based campuses around the UK with agricultural students in many of them. So my question is, how do we get the technology transfer to catch up? Because the speed of technology development now, I would say, yeah. is so quick yeah. that it's always been a challenge, but it's even yeah. more important now because those people are on programme. Yeah. So is there a way that we can do technology transfer and <coughs> science communication better to, to yeah. everyone, let alone those already in the industry? Well, yeah. yeah, one thing to say on that, I mean, I, I read a statistic uh, recently that 65% that, um, of today's students will work in jobs that don't even exist yet. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, so, so I think the key to this is, is flexibility, that um, we, in, in institutions like universities, colleges, we can't necessarily train people on exactly the, the, the systems that they'll be using in five years' time or, or ten years' time, but we, we need to give them the, the toolkit, the skills to be able to, uh, to adapt and, and, and to new systems. You know, so in, in my field, computer science, we don't train people to program in a specific language for a, for a specific system. We train them to be general, generalists and to be able to adapt to, to learn any system. So, so I think that that's part of the key. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's a real, it's a real, it is a genuine concerning issue and it's, uh, I, I, don't have a, I don't have a solution to that. It's just that everybody's got responsibility to help uh, with that. So we, we recognise that, 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 that fully. Um, sure but it, it's know, a, in every college, I would say, there are, there are, there are staff working who, who would want to do that. Yeah. And it's a case of how can they all do it better, I think. Yeah. Or, or work, work maybe with and, and link into what you're doing to cascade it. Yeah, and hopefully it's using technology itself to help cascade that. I mean, this is, this is being streamed out on the, the internet. So, so if we can use those sorts of resources, you know, all, that's, that's a wonderful thing. Um, but there's, there's always something more that we need to do. Yeah. In, terms of, in terms of innovations, I mean, we're talking about today about automation and, and we're basically looking at existing agricultural systems and saying how can we do them with computers, how can we do them with robots. Then, then I think you get to a certain point and then you start to see possibilities to re-engineer the systems and do them in completely different ways. Um, seen in, um, in warehousing, um, Amazon bought up a company called Kiva Systems that completely changed the way that warehousing op operations work in companies like Amazon. It used to be that you had human pickers and they would go around and walk, walk around a warehouse to certain bays and pick the stuff. Now they've turned all of their, the, the humans are stationary and they, they've turned the, the picking bays into robots and the, and, and the robots come to the people. And they, they massively increase the productivity um, by doing that. But that, that's a completely new system and that's, so, so I think you get to a certain point with automation but then you know, maybe, maybe there are completely different ways to, to re-engineer these uh, systems and do things in a completely different way. So I think it's the, the students now will be the ones that, yeah, will, will perhaps be able to come up with completely new ways of doing things and, and change, change, yeah, change the systems for the better. So instead of fitting uh, the robots to the way we farm, we might yeah. adapt the way we farm to suit them to be more appropriate I for think using absolutely. robots. I think that will happen. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think it, uh, it, it's fair to say that, the, as, as we've seen over the previous decades, that the future perspective is for the number of people on farms to continue to reduce, but the skill levels that are required of those people to go up <laughs> yeah. because of this increasing use of technology? Yeah, yeah. Very, very, very much so. I mean, I, I see the... Uh, I, I mean, Tom and I d d discussed this quite a bit, but, uh, you know, if, if you take uh, machine learning, for example, and trainability, uh, you, you've got to have a person who's training these, these robots. If you think of a modern tractor driver, they're not actually doing a huge amount, you know, CTF uh, controlled tractors or GPS uh, steering systems. So you've got a, you've got a, a, a human a resource on the, on the tractor who could actually be spending time doing the machine learning for the, for the robot. So it's, that's a very high skilled, upskilled job. Um, but I've, I've, you know, I've got no doubt the modern tractor driver is going to be very, very different and he'll be training robots, he'll be doing machine learning uh, as, as, as part of his job. That, is a, that will be a higher skill level. The challenge for 
product developers is just making that trainability as easy as possible so that you, you don't need high class computer science that, 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 you know, uh, uh, that anybody can do this. But that will be the future. It will be a, it will be a person who will be training, be machine learning. I have to stop reading Farmer's Weekly in the cab. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> Close one. Great. That's doing okay so far. Ah, I know. Keith Norman, you're here, aren't you? Where are you, Keith? Ah, there we are. A bit further away. Okay, here we go. You ready? Hooray. If, if you look at the, sort of the recent past of a lot of the development of this kind of technology, it was really dogged with a lack of compatibility and they were having systems, whether it be in-cab controllers, not talking to machines behind the tractor, sensors not talking, file formats not compatible, upgrades that would knock out systems. And it really was putting a bit of a break on the development of this technology. Has that now changed that you're aware of that people are actually working more together in a more sort of harmonious kind of culture and background because I think a lot of it was initially that you know manufacturers wanted to, to promote and create a system that only their system would work with and exclude all the others but you know in, in this world where we want to really progress this technology we need a compatible system that is, is you know works for everybody and uh, you know, are you detecting more synergy between the various players and instead of everybody working in silos, that everybody is sharing ideas and experiences. And, and really, the other part of my question is, is the new Agritech Center, the Agri-Epi Center that's based up at Harper, is, could that be an industry coordinator that's going to sort of act as a soundboard and a coordinator for all of these different silos that are going on all over the place with yeah. people working individually? I mean, I can comment from, from my field in robotics, this is, this is something um, that has, that's happened in the past 10, 20 years. That, um, when, when I was doing my PhD studies 20 years ago, everybody developed their own systems, every university had its own uh, software libraries, everybody did their own thing, everyone was completely siloed. And then um, just over 10 years ago, um, there was an effort by the whole robotics community to create uh, an interoperable kind of architecture, software architecture, which was called uh, uh, ROS, Robot Operating System. Um, it's actually not an operating system, but, it, but it's, it's middleware. But basically, we came up with a, with a way um, that we could share what we do. So, so rather than spending, uh, if you're a research student, spending 80% 80, 80 of the time developing the, the infrastructure you need to do your actual research, you could use these toolkits which are already there. And um, we can see this now going out into industry. There's an industrial version of this, this software. And I think, think that's a trend. That, that's also a, a trend that we see as part of this so-called fourth industrial revolution towards interoperability. You, you need to have standards, so at some point the big companies have to get together and, and agree on the standards or, or you know, what it, whatever mechanism there is, but I think you're absolutely right. You need to have that, um, yeah, you need to have that common uh, architecture plug and play, if you like. I think that's key to these technology developments that we're talk, talking about, the being able to share data and, and, and so on across, yeah, across the industry. So do you think we have to bang some heads together to make that happen, or are the manufacturers well, already starting to do this? I, um, um, I think there's a great danger that, that people will, uh, other technology developers will disrupt around them. Yeah. So I think, I think if they don't create interoperable systems, it, 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 somebody is going to develop an interoperable system which can be retrofitted. And I think that's what's going to happen. Um, uh, unless they really do start to bring this together. The whole of, uh, you, you can't realize the potential of agriculture until you can make all these devices in, interoperable. It's a real barrier. Uh, um, the world won't wait for that. Uh, the world will disrupt around it if that, that uh, interoperability is not given. So, so, so my message is, is, yeah, heads do need to be banged together. If, if, if they're not banged together, the world will just move on. Uh, look at IBM and Bill Gates. Uh, it's a great example. They they tried to do the hardware, got about the software. Uh, where's IBM? Where's Bill Gates? So so these things move very quick. 
I, I know that there actually are some initiatives in, in the background that are pulling some of these big manufacturers together to try and get them to agree standards because it, 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 there obviously there is a tension though between their desire to get a competitive edge and, and have a, an advantage over their competitors and the understanding that you guys won't adopt this stuff if they're all different competing technologies and it doesn't work together, everyone's going to lose out. But it's, uh, it's a, I know there are discussions taking place. Uh, and pretty much the same question I know was asked by Chris White as well. So thanks, Chris, for that. Um, Graham, you've attended all of these sessions. Uh, Graham Potter, should we see if we can do a person-to-person -person <laughs> throw this time and I don't have to get involved? And you've got, I'm interested to hear exactly what your question is. It's about the law and how that relates to these developments. Yeah, I mean, um, I've, I'll just briefly talk a little bit about our farm so you can get a bit of an idea. We have a um, 500-acre arable farm producing mainly cereals. Um, when we, the only time we steer a tractor is down the road. When it goes in the field, we don't touch the steering wheel. So basically our tractors and everything is, uh, run as robots as they are, apart from I sit there and go, OK. Uh, we also use drone technology using drones. And at the moment, like Amazon, they're delivering par we're wanting to deliver parcels. What I would like my drone to do is be able to fly out on a Monday morning or a Wednesday morning or whatever morning, go and fly the farm, and, uh, and then the following day have a load of data set there, sat there for me so I can then go spraying to go and spray those spots, spray those areas, which I'm doing already. And, uh, but at the moment, the law is kind of holding us back on some of these things, um, especially with, with the flying drones. That we can't just let them fly off and do what they want to do. Yeah. And I suppose it's a little bit the same with tractors, is it? You can't really set a tractor off. It goes out the, out the, the yard at the moment. Can we go to the field and do its thing and then come home? I mean, I'd like to do that because at the moment, all I'm doing is going, OK, that's all I do. Yeah. There's a tractor goes in the field, it turns around, lifts the kit, the kit up, it does everything it has to, and I just go, OK, every time. It's just, I just, I'm like a train driver that's just pressing a button, making sure I'm staying awake, yeah. whilst I'm watching a film on my iPad, you know. Well, you'll be, you'll be machine <laughs> but that's, learning. But that's what it is. <laughs> you'll, be, you'll be doing lots of training, I think. Uh, but but uh, uh, I, I, uh, my, my intake on this is, uh, is autonomous cars. Um, so... so uh, uh, th there's no doubt, I think it was on the news uh, this last week, that there's going to be a, an autonomous vehicle driving from Oxford to London uh, in, in a couple of years' time. I don't know exactly when. Yeah. But, uh, you know, if the, if the HSC are, any, are allowing that sort of uh, a level of autonomy in a public environment, uh, it'll come into a farm environment. So, so, so it's not there yet, but uh, we will, agriculture, I think, will follow autonomous cars. So it'll, it'll, it'll come. I don't know about drones. It's not my area of expertise. But I think there are other problems around uh, 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 aviation safety that I'm, that's not my area of expertise. But on autonomous vehicles, I think it'll yeah. be. I, I think that's a really good example because um, I think we'll tolerate a, a, a higher degree of error from a human than we will from a machine. Um, so, so, you know, we have car crashes all the time. Pe people die in road accidents. There's usually a human behind the wheel. But the, the moment it's an autonomous system, then you know, then, then it becomes a different thing. Um, so I think it'll take, a, take time for people's perception of this to change and the legal frameworks and things to change. But, but ultimately, if a, an autonomous system can be safer than a, than a human, then that should be a good thing. But uh, yeah, I think, I think there's, there's definitely a role for, for the human in the loop as well. Maybe, maybe not just pressing buttons, but yeah. you know, uh, I think there'll still be a role for, for the human no, in all of this. There'll be a role, yeah, down, down the line. Because you still need a human eye if something goes wrong, I think. I mean, yeah. if you send a machine out there and something goes wrong, it breaks down, there's nothing better than the human eye to say that a, a robot can't always tell when something has actually you know, gone wrong. You know, if a stone's jammed in or something, I'd, you know. So you definitely need that human, human eye thing. I mean, I'd love to see a load of bunch of a dozen robots on my farm whiz out every day and go and do, work, go and do the work for me. It'd be fantastic. And I know we'll get to that one day, and I'm looking forward to it. And, and hopefully, I'll be the first to do it. <laughs> and so I always like to see myself the first in the, on, on all new technologies. And I've actually done a few, a few firsts in the, in the world on our farm. Um, we were the first to do variable depth subsoiling. And the first, I, I invented a, a dryer app for my dryer to control my dryer from my phone. Uh, we did that about six years ago. It's about six years ago now. Nobody else had done that. And uh, just all these little ideas. And I always have new little ideas in my head. And the problem is, <laughs> I haven't got the money to fund these things. <laughs> so I have all these little ideas, what I want to do, and things I want to do, but I can't do anything about them. 
it sounds like you guys should be well, talking Jack. a bit more closely. <laughs> yeah. I think you've got a volunteer here yeah. to try out some of your new exciting kit on his farm. <laughs> Make a note. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. We're getting tight on time, so I think we have one more question from the floor. Um, uh, I've got one from Phil Edwards. Phil, are you here? Yes. Ah, great. Can you hurl it over to Phil? Excellent. Close call, but we got there. I actually asked two questions, but uh, the one that, um, one that I'm particularly interested in is uh, you have champions of technology who are investing in land, and I, and I mentioned out there Mr Dyson being one of those. He's been a champion of technology in the past, and now is heavily invested to land. Is there any way that you use champions like that, not only for UK agriculture and for UK, UK development, but also to help you in your causes? They're keen on technology and they've got deep pockets. Are we <laughs> tapping them? Well, I, th I think uh, that, that's, that's, one, that's, one, that's one great example. I, 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 you know, that what's, what's, what's really pleased me uh, and surprised me is, is the interest uh, of lots of technology companies, not, not just Dyson, but uh, defence companies, high-tech companies, photonics companies, IT companies, big data. I tell you, there's a huge interest in agriculture. Uh, so, and I think one of the great things about the ag tech catalyst and uh, that system is it's created a huge amount of awareness uh, in general industry about the opportunity within agriculture. And so, so I, I've, got, I've got no doubt that's been a really positive thing and that, that, will, st that will stimulate our industry for many years to come. So, so, so that there are lots of people who, who want to step in and my, my phone is always going with new companies who see opportunities in agriculture so i mean related to that there was um uh, some time ago the mars project was it monitoring agriculture by remote sensing and they were trying to predict yield effectively so that you could to some extent perhaps rig the stock market and yeah. see what the future's developments would be has that continued in any way or has that come to an end now uh no it's uh, it's uh, I, I i see it increasing um the classic example of that is the uh, crop insurance market. Um, so uh, who knows what the uh, Brexit's going to bring. But uh, if you go to France, they have a crop insurance market uh, where that market is underpinned by remote sensing forecasting yield. So, so, so uh, within the UK, I see that as going to be an enabling technology. Uh, it, it's uh, it's still, uh, still, still globally in I important in key commodity crops, cocoa, coffee, tea, all, all forecasted by remote sensing. So we've not seen a huge impact in the UK, but it, in, if we have a technology-enabled uh, British agricultural policy, we're going to see that. That will be an element of it, I'm sure. OK, I, I know there are still more questions that are out there, but we have to draw it to a close because we've got another part, the final part to this evening's session. Um, so two things. Firstly, I'd just like to really thank our two speakers uh, in the main part of the session tonight, Professor Tom Duckett yes, hooray, and Professor Simon Pearson. So can you give a big round of applause to our two speakers? <laughs> I hope you've been enthused and excited by some of the technology they're talking about. I certainly have. James, uh, we've got another poll we were going to ask, haven't we? Because as our final speaker uh, prepares, I thought we could put that final poll up. If you can sort of put that on the screen, and I will introduce... Or do we have it up there already? Ah, that's it. So, think about what would benefit you the most. So, the question on the screen is, would, what would be the most beneficial development in robotics, automated technologies, and associated software for you and your business? So if you can give that thought, whether you're in the audience or watching on the internet from home, uh, and while you're doing that, I'll introduce our final speaker for the evening. So we've heard a lot about the technology that's going to come down line in the future. To finish the evening, we wanted to bring it down to what's happening on the ground today, and I'm very pleased to introduce Jamie Marshall-Roberts, a new farming technology lead from Syngenta, our sponsor for this whole series of, of lectures. Um, Jamie is leading a team that's investigating and developing new technologies across a number of areas, including applications, drones, weather data, and image analysis. And he's going to look at some of the areas that Syngenta is working on now in robotics and automation technology. So, vote on the poll and give a round of applause to Jamie Marshall-Roberts.
Good evening, everyone. Uh, yeah, so my name's Jamie Marshall-Roberts. I work for Syngenta, and I generally believe I have one of the most interesting jobs in the company, because I get to look at shiny things. Um, you know, I'm looking at um, working with my team looking at application technology, so looking at uh, drift reduction, nozzles, um, how to get the most out of our products on farm uh, using conventional sprayers. Think about how that sprayer might look in the future as well, as we look at different technologies, as sprayers change in their, their look and functionality. And I'll talk about that a little bit more in this presentation. I also um, you know, kind of look at uh, imaging, image analysis, satellites, uh, UAVs. And I get quite passionate about this. So if I start droning on, yeah, please stop me. I can't compete with mechanical hose, I'm sorry. Yeah, so. <laughs> um, OK, so before the jokes get any worse, let's progress forward. So it's not necessarily a rosy picture when you look at agriculture in the next few years. We have quite a few challenges coming our way. If you look at the regulatory industry, you know, what's happening there with our crop protection products, they're becoming harder and harder to register, more and more expensive, and more products are also being removed as you know, the level of detection changes or we find more kind of hose around operator exposure. So how can technology help us in this area? How do we need to comp compete with the rest of Europe in Brexit? And you know, making sure we can keep that efficient, reliable food chain continuing. So we're in a space center. So it seems fitting to have something to do with space in here. So does anyone know what this is? Yeah. Satellite? OK, so this specifically is a Sentinel-2 satellite. So it's an optical satellite. Uh, are many of you guys here, I'm not very interactive with the guys on the internet, but are many of you guys here using satellites on farm for monitoring? Yeah, so a handful, OK. So they have some limitations, it has to be said. If it's cloudy, they're not particularly effective, as they rely on the line of sight. However, when they're not cloudy, they can be very useful. If you want to use uh, NDVI data, looking at kind of the biomass of the crop, or NDRE data, which is looking at the chlorophyll of the crop, we can start to look at how much variation we're seeing in that field. Now, if we want to use that for correcting uh, nitrogen applications or looking where crops looking more healthy or less healthy, we can use this information. And when we combine that information together and we incorporate it with yield mapping here on the right-hand side, we can start to get a far better understanding of what's happening in our fields. The challenge I have is actually it's quite hard to take all this data into one system that gives you some really useful outputs. What do you do with it? Especially if you're based in Scotland and some of the sites we've had uh, for monitoring within some of the trials work we've done and you only get one scan per year because it's too cloudy and the satellite isn't passing at that point in time. And that is a limitation. Now there are companies like Planet Labs who are throwing up lots of shoebox size satellites all the time and they are increasing the amount of resolution, the amount of hits of satellites passing over your, your farms at any one point in time. But still, it's got a way to go. So another satellite. This is Sentinel-1. Now this, I find quite interesting. Um, so synthetic aperture radar system is incorporated within this, this satellite. So that's cloud-piercing radar. So that enables 365 days a year 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you're getting an image of your farm. Now, reliably, I think they'll be passing every three to four days, capture information, and it's using radar. It looks at the, um, the ground cover um, that's been there, any difference in structure you're seeing. And also, they look like they'll be able to do quite reliable scoping of growth stage as well. So prioritizing, which, prioritizing what's happening with your crops and where you should be. So it's another tool that becomes available to actually use on farm at the moment, and this should be really more commercially available from this autumn this year. So, yeah, really very useful. However, the resolution is still not that high. Now, when we're talking about a 15 meter area here, that's still quite a large chunk of land, looking at 15 meters by 15 meters. Um, and we can do far better than that. And we can look at far more higher resolution imagery. Drones. How many people here have got a drone or play with it? OK, how many of you would say you're using them effectively? <laughs> OK, so that's encouraging. Um, so drones are great, brilliant fun. Um, if you're like my dad, you buy one for Christmas and crash it within about 30 seconds. Um, if you spend a little bit more money, and these aren't that expensive, it has to be said, relatively, compared to a satellite, it's very cheap. Um, so this is a Phantom 3. 
So this is now a bit outdated, but they are incredibly cheap. And really, for between five and 800 pounds, you can pick one up. The interesting part for me is, you can either fly this and you know, take a nice, pretty picture. Uh, this one's of uh, a trial ADAS, if Daniel, if you recognize the, the field. Now, this is great. We can start to see nice visualizations of trials. We can take nice marketing pictures. Um, it all looks very, very pretty. But for me, it's about giving the detail. Now, the first thing I think this does, it enables you to see variation from above. You look at a field from, you know, sat in a tractor cab, you see a little bit more than you are stood at the side of the field, but you put a drone up in the air, you can start to see a lot more. Start looking straight down, you can see a lot more than that. But why don't we start using them a bit more efficiently? Rather than just taking a picture up or flying around the field, looking for variation, why don't we look at starting to use that automation? And, you know, that becomes a very interesting subject to look at. So, an example. Uh, this is Sam. Now, uh, Sam likes to look around his field and make sure he understands what's happening in that field. So he takes his field and he thinks, right, I'm going to start doing some monitoring. So he goes around the field and spends a long time doing plant counts. There are a lot of plant counts in this field. Uh, Sam's not a normal person. Um, he works for me. Um, so he's going around and looking at um, a large-scale trial we're carrying out. And this took 13 man-hours to do that. So that was me and Sam out in the field in the rain, I might add, for six and a half hours um, doing plant counts. Incredibly precise, though. Lots and lots of detail. That's 13 hours. That's, that's a long time to do a lot of plant counts. So how can we start using technology instead to drive this forward? So we can use satellites. We can get you know, within five meter resolution with a satellite, which is, is pretty good. But all this is telling us is the biomass in there. It's not telling us so much around the actual plant counts. Now, satellite imagery can be incredibly accurate in high resolution. You know, the military will be able to read our newspapers for 10 years. Now, I'm not sure you want to pay that uh, level of pricing to be able to read a newspaper from a satellite for monitoring your crops, but we know that satellites can be used for monitoring. However, if we take a relatively cheap solution, and this is a, uh, an automated um, drone system, um, essentially we take that 13 man hour assessment and we turn it into a flight which took 10 and a half minutes. Now, this is usable. This is a, it's a company called Drone Deploy. It's an online cloud-based system. And it, you send your drone up, and it just flies up and down. You select the altitude. You select um, you know, kind of the, the pixel resolution you want. And it goes off. And you can see this um, field is 11 hectares, and it's 1.3 centimeters per pixel compared to 15 meters by 15 meters, or five by five, depending how much you want to pay. So it becomes useful. The thing I like about this in particular is it's using that kind of tri-band camera, the RGB camera that you get as standard on a Phantom drone. That's relatively cheap. We can spend a lot of money on multispectral drones, but this is, this is usable, and this is actually scalable. So what can it give you? So this is a, um, a picture, it's an author mosaic put together. So 312 pictures taken, um, I think it was 50, 75 meters height, whatever it was flying at, and it stitched them all together. So you look at the whole field, or you can zoom in and look at that 1.3 centimeter pixel and start looking at individual plants. Now that, for me, becomes really very useful for understanding what's happening in my field, and then I can start to think, well, how do I use that? How do I take it forwards? So there's a few things we can do with it. We can look at the... Um, with the picture and see visually with our own eyesight what's happening with it. We can start to look at plant health. Essentially, how green is it? These red bits here, um, they actually built a motorway here and dumped a whole lot of bricks there so that the plants aren't growing too well. Now, because I've been across the field and you've had that human interface in there and you understand what's happening, now you will have this in your own land, but actually, from my point of view, it's walking across and understanding what's there and using the technology to record that. We can also do plant counting. Now, this has to be said, you know, kind of the accuracy depends on how much you want to pay for it, really. Um, but that 10 and a half minute um, assessment, using a, a fairly cheaply available plant counting app online, it actually counted 6,094,000 and some of your plants from that 10 and a half minute flight. That is believed to be within 5% accuracy. And I'll take that. That's, that's pretty good. Now, Sam's very good at doing plant counting, but one day he might turn up hungover. You might feel a bit tired by the end of the day. It's not, you know, the humans aren't you know, kind of constant. We get tired after lunch. 
the drone just carries on going. Might just change the battery, but you know, it's, it's relying on that kind of autonomous effect. Um, we can also start to see other features in there as well, just for recording. Now, this is something we all know. We know if our field has got a hill in it. But actually, is that changing what you want to do? If you have a north-facing side of a field, do you want to carry on putting um, as much onto it as a south-facing? You know, if it's going to get less sunlight on it in the winter, you know, how do you man manage that rather than doing it holistically across the whole field? If you really want to, you can stick on some virtual reality goggles and look around your field. You know, 3D models are all produced by these systems. Um, I talked about spending more money. Um, we can spend more money. So this is a, an M100 drone with a Sequoia camera system on it. Um, it it's great. Um, you know, we, we're using this to start understanding far more in detail about what's happening uh, within the trials we're doing, on the farms we're working with. But once again, it is more expensive. And for me, the RGB cameras are, uh, are a bit more scalable. Now, the thing which makes it very interesting for me is this kind of variable rate side. Now, identifying variation in the field can be done pretty easily. The challenge is actually doing something about it. If we take um, herbicides here, if you were to use uh, a leading herbicide, Axial, for instance, how many times are you applying Axial on its own in a tank? You've normally got it in a, uh, a, a tank mix with various other chemicals in there. You might have some trace elements and uh, fungicides, insecticides, whatever may be with it. So do you want to change everything in that spray tank by 30% going through it? And, and this is one of the real blockers for me. This is about looking at technology moving forwards and how we can actually work with the, the manufacturers, uh, you know, the ironmongers actually building the sprayers, looking at direct injection um, uh, systems straight into the, uh, the line, closed transfer systems, which can then actually take these products and start to put them on where they need to be. Because I don't want to put the fungicide down by 30% there. You know, there might be some disease coming in. There could be a yellow rust foci developing as well as some wild oats. You know, how do we change that around? And that needs to be far more implemented within agriculture. Now, all these systems can be incredibly complex. So I spoke about the um, you know, kind of variable rate files and how you produce them using multispectral sensors. Now, this is a system using the Sequoia camera. The Sequoia camera itself and the drone, you're talking probably about 8,500 pounds to buy uh, one of those drones as a, as a basic package. If you want to use a processing system, um, and we talked about connectivity. So you can do this on your own computer. I wouldn't advise it because you might kill the computer, but you know, a standard computer um, you know, can have this installed onto it. If you want to do it efficiently, you need to spend about three and a half thousand pounds on a really high-end laptop to be able to process this data. Now, when you're spending eight and a half thousand on a drone, two thousand on the stitching software and the analysis software, and then three and a half thousand on a, on a laptop, it does get a bit expensive. But there are other options out there. You can go to cloud-based software. If you've got the internet connectivity to upload um, the gigabytes worth of data, and on a farm, you'll be talking about you know, terabytes worth of data, huge amounts of uh, imagery all uploaded. But we can start to see variation. Here, for instance, this is a spring crop which is only just establishing versus winter crops. We can see that variation, and then using systems to create shape files, we can, we can map it. So here, we're looking at um, establishment. You look at the establishment, and very easily, we can incorporate variable rate applications. Now, you can set this. Now, whether this is for a herbicide or a seed rate, it all depends on what you're looking at at the time. And that's that human interaction, that human interface. What growth stage is the crop at? What do you know about the history of that field? What are you looking at? Because at the moment, the drones do struggle to tell the difference between black grass and a wild oat and a wheat plant. You need to be spending a lot of money on systems to be able to understand that. However, with your knowledge, you can look at that area, you can see that variation, and you can decide actually you want a full rate in this area or a half rate somewhere else. And you can plug that into the machines pretty easily. So variable rate drilling, uh, are many of you guys doing that? Okay, so were you amazed how easy it is to do? Yeah, so for me, I, I come across a lot of people who say it's really hard to do. Um, now, I may not be the average person, but I had one of these Trimble Nomads in my office drawer. Which I'm sure everyone does, right? Um, so it took about 10 minutes to get this to talk to this Vardasad control box. Now that Vardasad drill was um, supplied by a contractor on that day. It was built in 2008. It hasn't been modified since then. And then this autumn we stuck a variable rate 
algorithm into it from this nomad using FarmWorks, and it took 10 minutes. The biggest problem was trying to strap that thing to the, uh, to the door. You know, and it just worked. Now, the contractor was really annoyed about this, because for the price I paid him to come and drill that field, he could have set himself up for variable rate. So I think for me, it's, it's having an understanding that actually the technology is out there at the moment. We have some limitations with the sprays, what we can use, and the tank mixes that come within it. But this is really accelerating. And the manufacturers, the ironmongers, um, I'm in a meeting about it tomorrow, looking at how we try and push this on in the, in the industry. Um, OK, so we, we touched on this beforehand. Um, in fact, you, have, um, you touched on this about uh, the online of sight. Now, at the moment, we have restrictions of using UAVs and drones, and we should be there in the field. Now, the drone deploy system, you go into the field and you tick a box saying, yep, I'm here, it's safe to fly. Drone takes off by itself, goes off, flies, comes back, and hopefully lands in one piece. Now, at the moment, the only thing stopping the drone operating outside the, the visual line of sight is we don't have an approved uh, detect and avoid system incorporated on drones, which is approved by the CAA. Now, if you look at what Amazon are doing, they are looking at using technology. Now, I'm not quite sure they'll be delivering packages using one of these drones, because it's normally a different kind of package that's delivered with one of these. But all jokes aside, what they're doing is really interesting. They are looking at very efficient drones. They're changing the design of the drones. It's not a quadcopter. It's not a fixed wing. It's a hybrid of the two, and it's delivering packages. And they're doing this. Yeah, they're based in Cambridgeshire. They're out there looking at how they implement this. And I'm, I really believe this will be a, gate open, a gateway for us. Opens it up, and... Um, yeah, we get to the stage where we have these little things. Well, Absolutely, I, I completely agree. If you have one of these going out, scouting your farm on a regular basis, you're not um, restricted by satellites. Um, you know, they can go out, scout your fields, come back, download the data, put it into an FMS system, which they then actually understand it. You look at the guys like Google, IBM, some of these massive data companies are looking at the algorithms behind all this information. Someone's going to crack this really soon. So I think we're... Um, we don't deploy run with it at the moment. Hmm? We don't deploy run with it at the moment. So yep. really hard with it, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm talking to those guys very regularly at the moment. They're, um, they're really uh, looking at doing this, and they're, they're pushing forwards. The thing I like about them, like I said, is the RGB imagery, because it's scalable and cheap. OK, so I've probably been talking for a bit longer than I should have been uh, by now. But um, yeah, I'd be delighted to take any, any questions anyone has on uh, any of these subjects. <laughs> it's exactly the same as mine. Brilliant. Oh. Um, do you see yourself having a role with translating this technology from trial scale to individual fields to a level where you can help farmers not uh, cost farms? Do you? I'm already doing it. Yeah. <laughs> I think the technology is accessible. What's not necessarily ac um, accessible at the moment is the, the knowledge transfer. So taking the information and... Um, so if you take, for instance, some of our genetic lines coming through, if we can understand and inform you of the phylicron, so the time it takes for each leaf to, to emerge, if we can give you that information saying, well, actually, look at the phylicron time coming through, therefore you need to be more reactive in this field on this particular variety, I think we can definitely be better at that and start pushing that forwards, and that's something we're definitely of looking at understanding more around our genetics and how we push that out. You mentioned uh, the notion of the drones at the moment. Sorry. You mentioned that the drones at the moment are finding it difficult to differentiate black grass from wheat. That would be a really, really useful ability uh, if it could differentiate, yeah. particularly when you, you know, black grass is appearing in a patchy fashion, not yeah. in a consistent fashion. So that combination of spotting the patchiness of it and where it's worse mm. and where you can then pick for your rotations or cultural controls, whatever controls you want to go with, how far off is that or is that available yeah. now? So I think actually, um, I want to say it's hard to detect between them. I'm talking at the growth stage at the moment, for instance, or at very early post-emergence timing. Actually, in heads, black grass looks pretty different from a wheat crop, so you can differentiate between it a bit more easily. So that side of it, actually, using PIX4D, um, you can go and under you can essentially select an area which has a patch of black grass, and it will look for all the other same spectrums of light across the rest of the field. So that you can do at the moment. 
So very just simply, just go out in July when it's going into seed, actually, and pick out the blackgrass <laughs> yeah. spots in July, get your images there and go back on yeah. that. We know blackgrass is going to spread four or five metres, you know, wind spread, so it's going to move around, machinery, you've got to factor that in. But yeah, absolutely, you can certainly go and see where it is and then react to it in the following year. With uh, ploughing, then, so we're using a broom. You don't, you don't have to plough. You still stay with the Claydon. You yeah, just deal with it. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, yeah, we're doing all this. We're doing all this. I've been um, just for two years. I've been doing this for now. Yeah, we're big into it this time. Now, yeah. Brilliant. It's great. A fantastic. This discussion is going, and I think we want to we want to keep it going. So that's fantastic. Can you give a big round of applause to Jamie for his presentation? <laughs> OK, uh, I asked you to fill in, uh, to answer a poll question a moment ago, so we're going to see the answer to that. So what do you want most? Here we go. So I think there's a fairly clear winner here. Winner here. The people here in the room and those of you on the internet who voted think that more detailed, accessible analysis of fields crops will be the most beneficial development for you and your business. Uh, so thanks very much to that. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this evening's event. I found it absolutely fascinating. I hope it's inspired some of you, either here in the room or watching at home, to go off and start to explore some of this technology. One of the things that certainly come across to me is, whilst there's some exciting things coming down the line in the future, there's an awful lot more we could be doing now. And I think we need to organise another visit to your farm, Graham, to look at some of the things that, that you're doing now. Uh, just a few thank yous. Firstly, a big thank you to all of you who came here tonight to the National Space Centre in Leicester. Thanks very much to all of you at home who are watching it on the internet. A very big thank you to Syngenta, who, without whom this whole thing would not be possible. So thank you, Syngenta, for supporting this series. Uh, for those of you at home, I'm afraid that's the end of tonight's uh, activities. For those of you here in the room, we have some food and drink over there, and I think the speakers are all going to still be here, so if you want to continue some of this great discussion over a bite to eat and some drinks, shall we head over there now? So thank you very much for coming.